All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope everyone's been having an awesome day. Um, okay, there we go. All right, cool. Well, let me make sure I'm focused so when I click my clicker, it actually clicks. So, um, so welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to uh, you know different uh, night for for uh, uh, for Tanya Louisville because uh, next week we're we're gonna be co So it's uh, uh, and I, I really appreciate. The, I, I'm not sure if anyone came in from uh, from the uh, Dutton Out Foundation group, especially because there was a screw up. Not only did it get created at the last minute, but then there was a screw up and actually originally scheduled for tomorrow instead of tonight. But then, then the Deppman Foundation fixed that. So if uh, if you're here, that's awesome. Um, all right. So real quick to our sponsors, you know, paying the bills. Um, so sure enough, I was talking about the Deppman Foundation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, you know, we have a special sponsor this month with uh, Not Commerce. Uh, that, you know, uh, who's they're going to be providing a quick little uh, demonstration. And then, you know, I, I always keep uh, Modus and, and Tech Systems on there. They're not actually doing anything right now because of Everything's online, but it's usually who provides us the space and the uh, and the food. Um, and so they, they've been sponsored for so long, so that's why I keep them on our sponsored list. All right, just uh, some upcoming meetups. So um, the next .NET meetup will be September 17th, and that will be uh, uh, Mads Torgerson talking about the future of C Sharp. He might know a thing about uh, uh, C Sharp. Uh, for those who don't know, Mads is the program manager for C Sharp. Um, and then on December 17th, and there will be others, I just um, don't have them all scheduled yet. We're going to have uh, Jeffrey Palmer, Palmero talking about uh, Blazor architecture patterns. So that, that should be a really interesting talk. On the other side, the Azure side, so August 27th, uh, Jay Harris is going to come uh, uh, back to talk about uh, basically DevOps using Azure DevOps. And then on October 22nd, we have uh, uh, Corey, and I'm drawing a blank on his last name right now. Um, but he's going to be talking about uh, building bots with uh, Twilio Auto Autopilot and Azure Functions. And sure enough, Corey is a, a uh, evangelist with, uh, or dev advocate, I should say, with uh, 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 Twilio. And then sure enough, I mean, there are other groups. So, um, Second Tuesday in the month is a little IT happy hour, although we did not have it last night for different reasons. Um, but that's always the second Tuesday of the month um, at 6 p.m. We are still doing those online. Um, little uh, tech leaders um, has been Tuesdays at 8 a.m. Um, we might be moving that because tennis is kind of going down. So I'm actually looking to, to move that around. But that is for whatever, if you're any type of tech leader, um, the idea is, is basically it's it's a it's a help group for each other, right? You know, talk about issues going on with your team and so forth, or good things. And then I also do run the Louisville Remote Workers Meetup. The funny part is is we're on hiatus right now uh, because that mean that group actually doesn't work very well when everyone works from home. The idea was to get people who work from home out of the house, and can't really do that very well right now. So that'll be our hiatus probably until January, February. Hopefully by then we can we can start meeting up again. All right, but I highly encourage you check other groups out. Um, I mean, you, you heard Cameron and and and, uh, and and John joking around about you know being around all the all the place. I mean, the great part about, or no, I don't want to say the great part because there's no great part about the pandemic. But a side benefit of the pandemic is that all these groups have gone online. And so you have the ability to to uh, to attend a lot of different groups. I mean, these happen to be a bunch of groups that I uh, frequent quite often. Um, sure enough, you see St. Louis, which John actually helps run the St. Louis group. Uh, .NET Vegas is run by uh, Jay Harris, who actually was our our last .NET speaker and our next Azure speaker. Um, but you see other uh, like the Tulsa group. Uh, Sean's usually here. Uh, he runs that group. So you know, lots of other groups around there. Um, Part of search about meetup.com is you can search for these, except for it wants the default to search for like your local 50 miles. Um, you just take that off and then you can find others. Along with that, there is the .NET Foundation virtual user group, uh, which hopefully a couple of you have come in from that. Um, so the .NET Foundation, you know, uh, basically 
Technion Foundation is an organization that was started by Microsoft to help guide the way by uh, uh, 4.NET, um, but it's not run by Microsoft. Um, it's, it's actually a completely independent group. Uh, well, I should say completely independent because it still receives a lot of money from Microsoft, and actually they do have a permanent board member on there. But um, one of the things that the .NET Foundation group is, uh, is doing is this virtual user group, right? You can check that out and meet up uh, .NET dash virtual dash user dash group. Um, and there's all, you know, they're getting more and more groups on there as they've been ramping that up. So um, definitely want to plug Copalooza. As I mentioned, that is next week. Uh, actually, I see Devin's on here. Devin will be one of our speakers. Uh, you know, we, we got uh, uh, over 100 speakers uh, uh, doing 143 sessions. Uh, well, workshops and sessions. Um, so, you know, it should be a, a lot of fun you know, over those uh, 19 through 21 first. Uh, obviously, completely online. Uh, so you don't have to be here in the Louisville area to attend this. Uh, we're going to have online uh, open spaces and everything. So we're, we're trying our best to make this a, as much as, nor as a normal conference as possible. So, um, and then one last thing, uh, uh, well, almost one last thing. Uh, so sure enough, I do, tr I do stream every weekday on uh, Taylor and Code. Uh, so it's twitch.tv slash Taylor and Code. Um, and we do all kinds of things in there. Um, and, and you can kind of see the motto that I've got for there, right? So it's, it's all really about us learning together um, and, and doing things on there. So and actually, sure enough, well, oh, that's right. I do have a slide for that. Tomorrow, um, you'll see, uh, um, oh, come on. I, oh, really? Oh, I don't have the software installed. I was trying to do the nice, I've got the spotlight remote. It's supposed to spotlight the thing. But uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, I'll be interviewing uh, Taylor Dresden. Uh, uh, who's actually a recruiter who actually does some really interesting uh, uh, conference talks. So that'll be tomorrow at 1130. Um, so the, but these are, you know, we've been interviewing a lot of speakers. Actually, Devin was one of the speakers we, we interviewed. Uh, and, and those are a lot of fun. You can find those up on, uh, um, on YouTube at, at that link. Or if you go to Copalooza's website, you can actually under conference and you see uh, uh, there's a Copalooza speaker series link, the links to all these. All right, and then sure enough, normally we would be going to BJ's restaurant, but of course we can't go to BJ's restaurant. Uh, so I do keep the, uh, the, the meeting going. I do, I stop the Twitch stream, but we do keep the, the Zoom meeting going. If, uh, and anyone who wants to stick around and, and just chat, you know, uh, I'll keep it open as long as people uh, stick around. Um, to include, I mean, there's been a couple of times where it's been one o'clock and, we, and we're finally wrapping it up for the night. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, do, I do believe in, in, in having that, you know, that outlet for people to uh, be able to talk to others. All right, with that, now I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to John, to talk about not commerce. Sounds good. All right. See if I can do this right. So many different uh, conferencing software. <laughs> okay, I should be sharing my slide deck. Yes. Is that, is that what you see? Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so I'm John Beluca and uh, I, as uh, Chad said, I uh, coordinate speakers and sponsors for the uh, St. Louis .net, .net meetup. So, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, we're just going to do a 15 minute lightning talk on not commerce. Of course, I'm a developer, so I'm a, one of those optimistic developers. So it's probably going to be a 45 minute talk. <laughs> Sorry, Chad. <laughs> um, anyway, a brief overview of what not commerce is, and we're going to look at some code, and then we're going to talk about what I think the real value of open source is. So let's jump right into this. So NopCommerce is a ASP.NET Core um, ah. architecture that uh, it's a typical Microsoft stack. It uh, has any framework. Well, it actually used to have any framework, uh, SQL Server, but pretty much it's almost like a sample architecture in many ways for how you would develop something in the Microsoft stack. The uh, storefront out of the box uh, looks, you know, if you kind of pull in all the sample products, uh, 
looks pretty well and um, is also responsive, which is nice. The administrator is also um, responsive, which works out well and does manage a lot of different aspects of a storefront. So when it comes to just your typical shopping cart, there's also a, even a blogging platform built in and just handling different topics that appear on the homepage and so on. There's a lot of different aspects that make up this architecture. It is a monolith by nature, but it's a plug-in architecture um, for how you can extend it. The history of Knob Commerce uh, goes back to 2008, so almost uh, 12 years ago. That's when it was first released. And a couple years later, there was about 5,000 active sites using Knob Commerce. Uh, in 2011, that's when they had they released their version two, uh, which they switched to the MVC architecture. And then in 2013, that's when they released their version three and added a lot more features of such, uh, such as being a multi-store and uh, having multi multiple vendor support. In 2017, that's when they started Prepare for .NET Core and they released their 4.0 version. And as of the last what I saw on their About Us page, in September 2019, there's over 60,000 active sites using e-commerce. Uh, matter of fact, the year before that, I know they had on their site, it was just 30,000. So in, really in one year, they doubled the number of active sites and they still are growing and keep evolving. So the different features that make up Knob Commerce, again, they're kind of what you would expect out of a shopping cart solution. They also optimize different things for SEO, uh, even uh, there's a great plugin architecture for even handling different payment methods and many other features that you can extend. Uh, the architecture is kind of like your common .NET architecture. However, the front end might feel a little dated. Um, it primarily uses the Razor View engine and a little bit of jQuery uh, to do some various aspects. There's a lot of talk right now what they're gonna go to next. Um, we're not really sure, it's very much up in the air, but I know Blazor's looking really appealing, at least it is to me. Uh, I'm not, again, not on the Knob Commerce team. I'm an outsider, but I'm pretty involved with the community. Uh, and the rest of the architecture, uh, SQL Server is a primary backend. They also now support MySQL as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it, when you look at this splash of technologies, it is a lot easier to see them in their appropriate swim, swim lanes, like the front end on the application layer, business logic, and data access logic. Uh, so there's other things with inside, such as AutoFact, when it handles uh, dependency injection is still used. There's also AutoMapper. Um, there's a good handful of other libraries uh, that are worth uh, seeing how that's implemented in a enterprise level software. A little bit of a brief history, in other words, not going back too far, when they released their version nine, that was uh, against the uh, 4.5.1 fr framework. Um, so when they went to 4.0, they didn't actually compile the .NET Core right away. They actually prepared to go to Core and they're compiled to 4.61. And when they went to 4.1, that's when they actually switched the compiler to .NET Core. Matter of fact, they didn't start compiling the core until version 2.1, which kind of made sense for the different aspects they were dealing with within Entity Framework at the time. And then they uh, focused on uh, support on running on Linux and Docker on their 4.2 version, then started to target the 2.2 framework of .NET. And more recently, uh, they released their 4.3 version a couple months ago, and that's where they refactored a lot of their data access and even switched out Entity Framework with a different ORM, which I thought was a pretty bold move, actually. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, a sensible move. And moving to um, version 4.4, it's always good to kind of check out where the code is on their GitHub site uh, to kind of follow what's going along. They're working towards uh, support for Postgres as well as MongoDB within this architecture. So let's look at some code when it comes to getting a good feel of the architecture, talk a little bit about the extensibility of plugins and the themes. So the solution, let's kind of break this down a little bit. You have three different libraries. You have nop.core, which is where you find a lot of your common code within the solution. Uh, your domain objects are actually a lot in, are in core. The nop.data is where you can find a lot of your data access aspects. And nop.services is where you can find a lot of your business logic. Nop.web is the actual storefront and the administrator now. The admin was a separate project, but now they rolled it into the same project itself. And that's why they did have this common library for the front end. It was really to support two different projects. There's a handful of unit tests uh, across the the code base, which definitely could use some improvement, but you know they keep evolving their their test across the solution. And out of the box, there's a good handful of sample plugins, uh, such as a uh, PayPal support and 
So there's a good handful of free plugins with the solution also out on GitHub uh, within their site or within their um, account. And you know, there's also their marketplace. The marketplace has a lot of free and paid for solutions by themselves and the vendors. So to get a good feel of this architecture, um, here we have on the front end, on not that web, you have your typical MVC architecture where the, when a user makes a request to the web, uh, it goes through a controller, that controller instantiates a model, that controller then returns a view that has a reference to that model. So nothing too crazy on the, uh, on the front end side. Now services, um, that's a library. Again, not a separate uh, solution or a separate endpoint per se. Um, this is all kind of running in the same context, but nonetheless, it's architected in a way to where it really could be broken out if needed. So the uh, controller will work with a service, a factory, something that's gonna apply some business logic and uh, prepare some data. That service will then work with domain entities and those domain entities are filled into the model. So the separation of concerns in this architecture is pretty well done. So if it has to go get data somewhere, the service will actually make a call into the repository. So the repository pattern is what's implemented in this architecture. And that repository will work, will work with something called a mapper. Now it's called a builder. They switch that aspect in 4.3, but nonetheless, it kind of does the same thing of applying the metadata to the domain entity. So you don't have different domain objects uh, from what you're, from what the, uh, I guess you'd say for how the database is structured. They use a mapping aspect to populate the domain entities. So let's look at some code. So on the, uh, here we are in the customer service, uh, in the service layer. And we were using the repository pattern here where this customer, customer repository is gonna get the customer by ID. So that customer repository, this might be kind of hard to see even though it's right on your screen, um, is actually uh, inheriting an interface of iRepository of type customer. And off that interface, you have this get by ID. So if we look at that contract of that iRepository, We see that uh, here we have the get by ID and you would also see uh, other methods against the domain, a lot of other CRUD operations like insert, update, delete that you could work with against that domain. So that uh, I repository is inherited by EF repository, entity framework repository. And it's kind of funny that you'll see sometimes comments in the code of what it, of why they took a certain approach of a you know, for example, get by ID kind of, it doesn't entity not find. So looking at this a little closer, there's also a property, the table property, which is a type of iQuery will of T. And it's really a pass through to the entities property that's a type of IDB set of, of type T. Um, what, so this was kind of new to me. I saw this pattern. I've seen the repository pattern many times and in the interface aspect, but I haven't really seen this aspect that you're about to see here. When it comes to uh, going back into the customer service class, some people might argue this should be in the data access layer, but this is in the services layer. And what you see is really more of a link to objects type query. And by exposing this uh, table property off the interface, you in theory could change out entity framework to a different ORM, as long as it handles that same interface. Uh, without having to change any of this code. Uh, at the time, you know, I was like, oh, it's, it's kind of cool, but you know, if they're committed to any framework, I don't know why they went to this level. Well, in version 4.3, for what was Entity Framework, is now using Link to DB. And Link to DB was new to me <laughs> when I discovered that they switched to this ORM, but now Link uh, to DB has fully replaced Entity Framework. Now, as a developer, did they have to do that? Uh, I don't know. They probably could have done some more things in any framework to make that more optimized, but they found, I guess they, well, they did find better performance with that library and also better support for moving on to like MySQL being uh, supported as well. Link to DB is an open source library and uh, it's kind of a open, an ORM that's right in between what Entity Framework is and what you'd find in these different micro ORMs like Dapper and Massive and Petapoco. Um, so that syntax that you saw where that link to objects query is getting projected to Entity Framework, that query did not have to change, which is pretty cool. And that was probably one of the drivers of moving to this library. 
So this framework just continues to evolve in, in many ways, and I keep seeing it for the better because they're heavily focused on performance and, and supporting other data stores. So the marketplace, you can find a lot there, for, uh, paid for and free, it's worth checking out. Uh, this course on Pluralsight is pretty dated, but the actual flow of creating plugins uh, is still pretty much the same. Um, so that's not a bad course to still check out. Um, when it comes to themes versus plugins, themes are more about the front end. So all that markup and whatnot you want to change there, and where plugins is more about the business logic as well as maybe data manipulation, different aspects of you know that side of things. So a plugin you can even on installation create your own series of tables if you really need that plugin to track other data. So it's pretty powerful what you can do um, really within both themes and plugins. And themes are as simple as kind of copying that folder of that markup into a new folder. And then from the admin, you select that folder to be your themes. All right, so to kind of wrap things up here, the real value of open source when it comes to looking at NopCommerce, you can use NopCommerce to better understand just full stack development. Uh, you can use NopCommerce for secondary income. That might be a little obvious on creating plugins. Um, you can use NopCommerce as a reference architecture. And this one's kind of a big one for me. So first off, you have a lot of these different coding schools. Uh, this one is in St. Louis, the Claim Academy, um, which they offer, let's say, these two different tracks. You can be a Java full stack uh, developer or a .NET full stack developer. And when it comes to being a full stack developer, it's almost like you're more of a generalist. You're kind of expected to know aspects of the front end, back end, the databases and how things are stored, DevOps when it comes to automation, mobile development. It's, you just feel like you're in and out of a lot of these different areas of software development. And you start to feel like an imposter <laughs> along the way. So when it comes to this full stack developer, this jack of all trades in software development, you know, there's my advice. So when it comes to being a full stack developer, you need to settle on these three different things. You first need to choose a stack, really choose a stack that's kind of your basis of even evaluating other, other stacks. So in this example, even for myself, I continue to choose the Microsoft stack uh, and .NET as I look at other stacks and other communities. Uh, the learning platform, I highly suggest this. Pick a learning platform. For myself, I choose Pluralsight. I watch a course a week and it kind of helps me with that imposter syndrome on keeping up to speed. And lastly, choose an open source solution. I don't care what it is. But of course, I chose NopCommerce and it really helps me kind of work with that architecture and maybe change things within that architecture uh, to see how it looks uh, with other, uh, you know, and other technologies. So those stacks, just to clarify some of that, you know, on the Microsoft side, you know, you have all these different languages and and then on the Java side, which is driven by Oracle uh, for the most part. And then I call it the Go stack, which is kind of the Google stack. Most of these stacks are driven by a company. And except for maybe what we call the community stack that has, it's kind of all over the place in many ways. Um, but nonetheless, when I look at a stack, it's primarily driven by a company, whether we like it or not, uh, outside of the community stack itself. Now, many of us dabble in the community stack or do a lot in the community stack but it does have value to pick one of these other company driven stacks for a, a basis if you're new to software development. Um, picking a learning platform. So as of the subscriptions, you know, Pluralsight, LinkedIn Learning, I su suggest a subscription over to doing the a la carte. Because of course, there's a lot of great stuff on YouTube as well. But if you really need a learning path and just keeping up to speed on different things, almost like the, you know, the Netflix for online learning, uh, I would recommend Coral site or LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning is pretty awesome too. All right, so to wrap this up, uh, pick an open source solution. Uh, WordPress, by far, it's still really popular. It's worth checking out. Um, if you want to have something that you really want to get involved with in open source. Magento, it's open source, but it, they got by Adobe, bought by Adobe, so now they only have a community edition. Uh, Broadleaf is a Java open source stack uh, for e-commerce. And in the .NET realm, there's a good handful of them out there you can check out. And Brocco on the CMS side, Orchard. Uh, but of course, I chose NopCommerce for what I, what I wanted to dive into. And the different opportunities with the NopCommerce, yes, there is the marketplace uh, where you can sell plugins and themes. That's great. Um, you can focus on jobs, get certified. Um, I've been getting a good handful of projects in the NopCommerce space just by giving talks on it. So when you start championing in many ways an open source solution, uh, it starts to attract. So 
Knob Commerce, the space is, <laughs> there's, there's still growing. So there's room. Um, you can be a store owner. You can actually apply to get, have a drop shipping site or some downloadable content. Um, more importantly, and I can't highlight this any more than saying that when you're in job interviews, um, by far, you know, you're going to get asked about your experience and you're probably going to talk about your current job, which is normal. It's expected. But accidentally, you may say some different trade secrets, whatnot about that job. Um, or you might be involved in open source. You might be talking about your open source project and you're really excited about it, but sometimes that can even come across as a negative just because it, the interviewer might be thinking that, well, you might be trying to implement your <laughs> open source project on, our, on, our, you know, on the day job. There is this third option, and I highly recommend this, is that have a reference architecture, such as NopCommerce or something else that's in the stack in that space that you're focused on, that you can talk about that reference architecture in a job interview when it comes to communicating aspects of dependency injection and uh, the repository pattern, a lot of these different aspects of software development, I highly, highly recommend having a reference architecture that you kind of focus on and champion. And there's a lot of space for a .NET developer to get involved within NOP Commerce. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of growing aspects within this solution. Uh, let's see. All right, so yeah, to wrap this up, I know I'm going a little long. Like I said, I'm a developer, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so download this today. I, I, I can't recommend it more. And uh, it is the fast version of the Opcommerce server. They improved caching as well. It does compile the .NET Core 3.1. Uh, now they have support for MySQL. Um, we also recently recorded uh, what's new in version 4.3 at the Opcommerce Global Meetup. So a couple months ago, I started the virtual uh, meetup, Not Commerce Global, and our next meetup is actually this coming Tuesday. And again, it's a global meetup. We have it for the US side, we have it in the mornings. Um, this talk is gonna be, is gonna be um, actually best practices for uh, plugin development. So it's gonna be a really good talk to catch. It brings uh, about 150 people online. So it's a really good meetup that kind of grew pretty quick. If you really want more of a walkthrough of this architecture, I was up in Redmond, um, I guess almost a year ago, uh, doing a walkthrough, so that might be worth checking out if you want a few more details. And lastly, um, feel free to email me if you want a copy of these slides, um, if you want a presentation of what I shared with you. And uh, yes, if you want to sponsor a meetup, whether it's a singles meetup or the NOP Commerce meetup, reach out to me, uh, questions, feedback. More importantly, uh, well, actually not more importantly, but one of the things I don't want to forget, I'm going to be releasing the NOP Academy this fall. So if you're interested in training around NOP Commerce, I look forward to that. But more importantly, I'm going to put my email, john at nopacademy.com, in the chat for you to just email me about uh, receiving a $50 gift card. Um, so NOP Commerce, I mentioned I was going to be giving this light talk, lightning talk at various meetups. Uh, open source uh, Vendors really don't have any money, so it's great for them to offer $50 a meetup that I give this lightning talk. So I'm going to handle this by just send me an email. Um, it's just for the purpose of doing the drawing. And I'm going to put the first name and or first name and initial of who the winner is in the uh, in this meetup's post at the in the in the comments. But of course, I'll reach out to that person directly of who the winner is as well. So uh, yeah, email me at john at notacademy.com. Just say um, you know, Louisville meetup, and uh, I'll know the, our Louisville meetup drawing that way. And uh, that way I'll know it's you. I'm going to draw before tomorrow morning and post uh, sometime tomorrow morning. So email me before the end of tonight if you want to be in the drawing. And your chances, I think, are really good. So <laughs> hopefully you'll do that. And that's all I have. Sorry I went a little bit long, five minutes a little long. Is there any questions or? Think we're good? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Great. Sorry Thanks, about that. Really, oh, no problem. Really do appreciate that. All right. And with, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Cameron. Cameron, you're muted. So I thought it was really clever because I had turned off my mic and totally forgot I was muted on Zoom because I thought I was going to be really professional about this. <laughs> so I appreciate stumbling on this right off the gate. So now I get to fight with Zoom part two by making sure I share the right screen. So if everything is working correctly, you should see something that looks like a presentation. Yep, there we go. 
Wonderful. Um, Chad, while I'm presenting, I'm not going to be able to see the chat. Um, and so if you don't mind moderating for me a little bit, I definitely appreciate it. Yep, sure thing. That's, that is one of the problems about Zoom. You can't yeah. see the chat when you're presenting. Uh, I don't know. Devin's pretty vocal. I don't know if I'd want to see his comments coming through real time. That might knock me off my game. <laughs> <laughs> But cool. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully you're in your right spot. You're here to learn about functional programming via rebuilding of link. My name is Cameron Presley, and let's go ahead and get started. So uh, first and foremost, no need to take notes. Everything you're going to see this evening is live already. So you can either uh, scan this QR code, or if you go to my blog slash presentations, you'll see, you'll find the slide deck, articles, books, source code, everything we referenced here tonight there. So you could technically take all of that and run away and not have to listen to me present. However, there may be certain slides that make zero sense to you. So that could be problematic. So you're already here. Might as well uh, go ahead, sit down and enjoy. So uh, a little bit about myself. So I am a lead uh, software engineer for a company called Century One. So how many of y'all deal with SQL Server databases as part of your day job? Feel free to raise your hand or shout hi or dump something in the chat, right? Probably some of you, especially if you're in the .NET community. How many times have you ever went, what in the world is SQL Server doing? Why is my query so slow? Oh goodness, what's any framework doing that I wasn't expecting, right? Well, Sentry One has a suite of tools that can help you figure out what's going on in your databases. Um, one tool I'd highly recommend checking out is Plan Explorer. So if you're ever curious why your query is so slow or why it's trash, that tool does a great job of telling you what's going on. And it's free, as in please use it. Uh, I've actually worked on that tool, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP. So all that means is I talk about technology stuff. That does not mean I'm a technology expert or guru. It just means I like sharing with the community here. Uh, I'm also the director of speaker relations for a little tech conference in Knoxville called CodeStock. So if you've ever attended CodeStock in the last, let's say three or four years and really enjoyed it, uh, I appreciate that and you're welcome. I'll say we try to do a good job there. In addition, I run a functional user group in Knoxville, Tennessee called Functional Knox. So I dabble in functional programming a little bit. So enough about me. What are we going to talk about tonight? All right. So first and foremost, we're going to talk about what is Link, right? What exactly is it? How do we use it? Things like that. Because I want to make sure that everyone's got at least somewhat of a foundation here. Um, once we understand what Link is, we're going to actually look at the different components you have to understand in order to actually implement Link. So there's only three things, but once you understand those three things, it all makes sense. And if I do my job correctly, it'll definitely make sense to you all. Once we look at the fundamentals, we'll actually implement the Trinity, the three most common uh, link uh, commands, select, where, and aggregate. And we'll actually derive this code, right? So based on how we use it, we'll actually end up defining it and refining it over time through multiple refactors. Uh, the big thing here is that none of it's magic. Right, I'm not. I don't have any sleeve. I don't have any tricks up my sleeve. No crazy magic going on. It's just code, though it may look a little bit interesting. Sound good? Wonderful. We've scared everyone mute. Chad, this is going to be great. It's going. It's going to be good. All right. So let's let's talk about link. Right, and the best way to really look at link is to look at some code. So let's say I've got this class called a delivery team. Um, it is a property bag of a class, right? It's got three properties, a name, a team lead, and a member count, right? And let's say that I create a list of these delivery teams, right? Maybe I've got one called Alpha Team, another one called Back to the Code, another one called Skill Overflow Exception, which fun fact is the team I, I lead, and then maybe another team called Getting Things Done. And you as a developer are tasked with trying to figure out which delivery teams have more than seven members, okay? Not too terribly tough of a task, I don't think. So maybe if you're not familiar with Link, you would probably come up with an approach that looks something like this. So we create a list called too large of team names, and then we iterate through the list of teams. And if any of the teams have more than seven members, we add it to this list and we return back this list. Nothing too crazy, I don't think. The thing that strikes me about this code is that there's actually a lot of boilerplate here that you may have already kind of been accustomed to. But if you actually take a look at this code, there's only really two lines you actually cared about. Anybody want to take a guess what those lines may have been? Feel free to shout it out loud or in the chat, either works fine. Stunned silence, love it. Everyone's too scared, it's all good. So 
it's actually these two parts, right? You actually don't care about the for each loop. You actually don't care about adding things to a list. You don't even care about the temporary list for all intents and purposes. You really only cared about this if check and this team name. Wouldn't it be nice to write code that focuses on the business rules more so than boilerplate? Well, with Link, you can do such a thing. In fact, the alternative solution using Link would have looked something like this. Teams.where, where, where uh, T such that the member counts greater than seven. And then for all of those teams, we're gonna just grab the names from them. So what's really cool, right, is that this brings us foremost into the front of what we were trying to do, right? Like here's the business rules. It's smacking you right in the face, can't miss it, right? So very brief introduction of Link of how you can use it. So let's look a little bit deeper. Link at the end of the day is a set of operations that work on data independent of the source. So it doesn't matter if it comes from a database, it doesn't matter if it comes from in memory, it doesn't matter if it comes from a file or a network or an API call. In addition, when you do any of these operations, these are type safe, which means that if you try to do something you're not supposed to, the compiler catches you. Uh, I don't know about you, but I hate it when the compiler smacks me on the wrist because I forgot a semicolon somewhere. I'd much rather it tell me, hey, hey, Cameron, that, that property you're trying to access literally doesn't exist on that type. Try again, right? I want it to be helpful, not smacking me on the wrist for minor things like missing a semicolon. So let's take a look at why I think Link's really important. Um, so here was the code you originally had. Here's the code that you had you have now using Link. I like writing less code. That sounds wonderful. I like writing less code to accomplish the same thing, especially if it happens to be a little bit more efficient. So we've looked a little bit at Link, right? Um, I, we didn't explore all of it, but have you ever wondered how Link works under the hood? Like, how does it know? How, 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 how does it do? Well, what's interesting is that Link, all the magic of Link actually comes from three components. So you need to understand the func data type, you need to learn a little bit about generics, and then you have to learn a little bit about extension methods. So that's what we're about to go to next. But before I go any further, are there any questions in the chat? Now I'm making Chad earn his keep by uh, doing all the, the paperwork here. Not like he has enough on his plate or anything like that. No, 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 no comments. I, I did forget to mention, you know, when you asked the, uh, which line of code, Actually, someone in Twitch actually noticed it. I, I didn't notice until after you answered the question. Oh, nice. Well, person hanging on on Twitch. Awesome. Thank you. I just, I just now need you to shout louder. Just into the <laughs> uh, If only, if only, right? Okay, but cool. So uh, I'm going to assume that we know a little bit, uh, either little or next to nothing about all these things. So uh, if you've got questions or I need to slow down, just feel free to ask. This isn't a conference talk, right? This is me trying to help uh, you all learn some cool new stuff tonight. So let's start with the func data type. Let's get functional with this. So what, what is a func? So func was introduced back in C-sharp 3.0, which for those of you playing along at home meant 2007. So this, type, this data type has been around for a minute. What's interesting though about the func data type is that it's not so much a type like an integer or a string. It's a type that when you invoke it, it returns a value. And what's even more interesting about such a type is that when you invoke it, you have to you have to provide all the parameters that it needs. Sounds confusing, doesn't it? Let's look at some examples and how to understand func in real life. So we've got a func, and it's got angle bracket of int. How do I read this? Well, if you see this signature, what this tells us is this is a function that takes in no inputs, and it's always going to return an integer. So an example implementation may look something like this. Uh, we'll call this function get number. The open close parenthesis means it takes in no parameters and it's going to return back the value two. So that means no matter how many times I invoke the get number function, it's always going to return two. Hopefully not too bad. Let's take a look at something a little bit more interesting. So if we have this signature func int comma string, does somebody want to take a guess about maybe what the type is or what type of function this has to be? Okay, so this type of function says, if you give me an integer, I will return you back a string. So an example implementation of this is a function we call toString that says for any given x, I'm gonna call x dot to string on it. There's other implementations, maybe it could have also had, uh, try to do some fun parsing or whatever, but that's how you read the signature. The 
Now let's take a look at one more complex example and then we'll break it down. So if we've got a signature like func int comma string comma string, this is a function that takes in two parameters, an int and a string, and it's gonna return a string. So the trick here is starting from the left, all those types you see are the input parameters and whatever the last thing you see is, that's the output has to be. So a really terrible function we could write here to satisfy such a condition is this piece of code, like I said, it's terrible, called repeat string, that if you give it a string, it will give it back to you repeated, you know, whatever number of times. So you're like, Cameron, this seems like, why are you talking about funks? I like, I, I see this is cool, but why does this have to do with link? Well, let me show you. Remember this code where we did teams.where and we had this T such that member count greater than seven and name? Well, you didn't know it, but that's actually a func. You actually did an inline func there, lambda. And under the hood, lambdas and funks are essentially the same. There just may be some compiler magic going on. But if you were to actually like hover over this in Visual Studio, it would actually tell you what the data type here is. It's actually a func that says, given a delivery team, I'm going to return you back a Boolean. Kind of cool. The other func you may have used is right here for the name, right? So its signature, it says, if you give me a delivery team, I'll return you back a string. So even if you're not an expert in the func data type, if you've been using link at all, you've actually been using funks under the hood. You just may not have realized it. And in fact, I could have refactored this code to make it even more explicit what we're doing. Let me show you. So here I've defined the more than seven function and then the get name function. And the definitions are exactly the same as what they looked like before. The only difference is though, is the teams portion, right? Teams.where. Instead of doing that inline function, I'm actually passing in the name of the func. From a codability perspective, it's exactly the same, but I could argue it's a little bit more readable. Um, question for the group. How many of y'all like unit testing? Maybe, anybody? I like unit testing. Testing's fun, right? Okay, well, let's say that you wanted to put some unit tests on that, on the idea of does more than seven work the way we expect and get name? Well, we could easily do that. What we would do is we would extract uh, those funks and make them their own methods. So um, you'll see here that we defined a new method called get teams that are too big. You give it a list of delivery teams, they'll tell you which ones are too big. But this is what may be catching your attention a little bit. We defined this new method called does team have more than seven members? And this is a method. Notice that there's no func data type running around here. What's really cool is that under the hood, the compiler is actually um, using the does team have more than seven members as a delegate, essentially making it a func and passing it in. So this is a pretty cool way that I can take the logic I'm putting in link, extract it out to methods and then put test around your methods. Now, granted, we'd have to make these public, but that's okay. And we do the same thing for uh, the get team name here. So given what we've talked about so far, Anybody have any questions about the func data type? Is this somewhat making sense about why you kind of need to understand this a little bit in order to do link? There is a, a comment on Twitch. Uh, nice. Where it says, uh, I, I actually use uh, fluent assertions. Nice. I knew you were gonna be excited by that comment. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I've, I've used that library a couple of times, but fluent insertion is really awesome, right? Because it allows you to kind of chain this, make this a little bit more readable. You can pass some funks. Yeah. Good design there. So awesome. I think Devin's agreeing with that. Woot woot. Alrighty. So if no one's got anything else, let's go to the next part. All right. So let's talk about writing more general code, leveraging, uh, generics. Um, it may not be your cup of tea now, but it will be soon. I promise. Uh, I have a two-year-old, so dad jokes are totally within my realm of expertise here, have to be. So generics uh, were introduced back in C Sharp 2.0. So I think that was like 2005, 2006, something like that. So they've been around for quite a while. So what's interesting about generics is that it's not a type. Like the generic concept isn't a type, it's actually a type parameter. And so that allows you to genericize your code in a way that wasn't possible before. And the reason why you might want to use generics is when the code you write actually doesn't care about the types it's using, the implementation would always be the same. And you're like, Cameron, that's stupid. Of course my code needs to know about types. I work in a statically typed language. 
So why, how can I ever write code where the type doesn't matter? And I get to joke with you and say, well, unfortunately you've been using generics all this time if you've been in C sharp for any length of time. Uh, Y'all ever worked with a list? How about the list data type? Surprise, it's a generic. The funk? Oh yeah, also generics. In fact, if you're ever in C sharp or in .NET and you see these cool little angle brackets, you're working with a type that allows generics. It's generically defined. And when you do the angle bracket and pass in a type, you're actually providing that type parameter. And you're probably thinking, Cameron, this is confusing. What in the world are you doing? Let's look at some more code. So let's say that I've written this data structure called number Q. And it's got two methods on it. It's got add and it's got a pop, right? So you knew up this number Q, you can add things to the Q, you can pop things from the Q. And it works with numbers and it works great for integers. But let's say that in the code I'm working on, I now need to be able to support adding strings to such a Q. I go, all right, this should be really easy. It's going to look something like this. Well, I don't know about you, but as I start looking at both these classes, man, they look really similar, don't they? Like, in fact, maybe the only difference is, is the types. When you find yourself writing code that looks something like this, this is screaming generics. This is exactly what it's talking about. So how can we refactor this to use a generic? Okay, so I'll show you real quick. So we'll create a new class called Q. And something that's gonna catch your attention is I've done this weird little bracket T thing at the top. The minute I do that, I'm essentially telling anybody using this Q class, hey, you have to pass me a type. You have to let me know what type of Q that you want. And because I defined the generic at the class level, everywhere that you see that T, it's the same T. So all of these locations is all referencing that same T. So what's interesting now is that now that I've got this generic put in place, when I wanted a string Q, I can say Q of string equals this new Q string, and that works. That Q now has its type parameter. It can now be in existence, right? It now knows it's going to only work on strings. Same thing for the integer type. Making sense so far? Kind of, maybe? Wonderful. No one's shouting me off stage. Chad's like, yeah, yeah, Cameron knows what he's doing. Good, 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 good. So you did get a sure in the comments. Wonderful. Uh, I, oh gosh, this is going to be really bad, man. It's because the dad jokes are only going to get worse, right? That the humor is going to get worse until, until uh, morale improves. So when you're working with code and you're trying to figure out like when do generics make sense, it's really when you're writing that third structure in a row and you're like, dang it, man, this looks super similar to everything else I've written. And it's really going to stand out when the logic's the same, but only the types are different. So at this point, if funks kind of make sense and generics kind of make sense, you're two thirds of the way there of learning everything you need to know about link and how to implement it. So let's look at the third piece. So if you're gonna do with link, you're gonna to have to learn about extension methods. So let's take a look at these things. So the ability to do extension methods was introduced in C-sharp 3.0. Have you noticed a pattern yet that like all this stuff seems to be happening in like C-sharp 2, C-sharp 3? And it's even more interesting because Link was also introduced around that time, almost like Link needed these things to exist. But so what's cool about extension methods is it allows you to add functionality to types without having to recompile code or creating a wrapper type. So this is really cool when you want to add functionality to types you don't have access to, maybe because they're built in .NET types, or maybe they're types that you don't have access to because maybe they're coming from a NuGet package or a third party library. Um, if you all have ever used Dapper, then you'll realize that at Dapper under the hood is a ton of extension methods off the IDB connection type. That's kind of how it works there. So let's take a look at some um, extension methods. So at a high level, if you're going to do an extension uh, methods, you typically put them in a public static class and convention is whatever type you're extending followed by extensions. So just by looking at this code, you know I'm about to extend the string, uh, the string type. So maybe I want to give a method on string that allows me to call, uh, that I'll always capitalize it. So I do public static string capitalize, and then we've got this string s, the static portion of this method definition and the this portion of the method definition is what allows us to attach this method to the string type. And once I do that, 
I write my logic as the case is, right? So if it's another white space, I'm just gonna give you back the string. Otherwise I'm going to two upper and give you the sum string. So that means anywhere in my code base, as long as I've got a using or I've imported this extension, I can just do any string dot capitalize and that'll work. Pretty cool. Um, another way we could do it, right? We can write more extension methods, right? So there's another one that will do alternate casing on a string and it's a terrible implementation, but it technically works for a demo, which is all that really matters, right? But that's essentially it, right? You can attach methods that can do whatever you want to a type. That's what extension method is at um, the end of the day. Making sense so far? Kind of, maybe. Cool. So here comes my favorite part of the presentation. You could have invented link. You can write your own version of link without ever having to use the built-in link. If you know those three concepts, that's all you actually need. And in fact, it's so well known, uh, like with extension methods and the ability to use link, that if you actually were to go to the Microsoft docs on extension methods, there's this cool little paragraph that talks about the most common extension methods are the link standard query operators that attach to the I enumerable and the I enumerable of T types. That's in Microsoft docs. That's how ingrained this stuff is. So enough talking about the three concepts. Let's actually get to implementing some of this stuff, right? Let's, let's, let's get to more hands-on keyboard. So as we implement the different methods, uh, some of the different methods of link, we have a couple of guidelines. We know we're going to have to extend off the I enumerable type because that's what link does that Microsoft provides. The other two restrictions we're going to have is we're going to follow the same signatures of link. That means the same inputs, the same outputs. And the third one, which a lot of people don't actually think about is we have to follow the same properties as, as link. And we'll talk about what we mean by a property once we get to the various methods. But this is what we're going to keep in mind as we're kind of deriving this stuff on the fly. So let's talk about the first method with map. Um, and I'm specifically choosing the non Microsoft name for a lot of this stuff. So, you know, I don't have any tricks up my sleeve or do anything like that, but I'm also trying to keep words that are commonly used in other languages when it's doing this type of functional thinking. Hey Cameron. Yes. What's up? I have a question. Uh, would capitalization work on an instance of a string? Work on an instance of a string. Yeah. Like I can just do double quote, some string, close double quote, and then do capitalize and that would have worked. Is that the question? I'm not the one who asked it. <laughs> I know, right? Like, it's like, yeah. Uh, no. uh, so we also had it uh, because it was declared static. Yes, that's um, that's because it's an extension method. Be, for, the, for that to attach, you have to make it a public static method and um, the this keyword. And in fact, if you forget any one of those pieces, Visual Studio will give you a helpful message saying, hey, it looks like you're trying to do an extension method, but you messed up. You might want to add this keyword which is one of the few times Visual Studio, in my opinion, does really Ah, oh, cool. Awesome. All right. So that's that's good. Good timing in there, Chad. I appreciate that. So back to map. So the map method, known as select and link, is a pretty interesting uh, method. What it does is it will change a collection of one type to a collection of another type by using some mapper function. And the select or map function has one really interesting property. You're guaranteed that it maintains the length of the collection. So if you have a collection of 10 items and you call map, you get a collection back of 10 items. It's never nine, it's never seven, it's never empty, it's never null. It's whatever length you started with, you are guaranteed that. Pretty neat. So let's take a look about how we could derive this on our own. So we've got delivery team, right? Good old delivery team. And we want to take a look and write some code to figure out what are all the names of the delivery teams we have, right? Maybe we're generating a report or something. So we write some code that looks like this and it looks pretty familiar. We're gonna iterate through all the teams, grab the team name, add it to this list. Problem solved. Hey Cameron, you got another question. Uh-huh. Is there a flat map equivalent in link.net? Ooh, flat map. The no, you would have to build it. The closest thing that you're going to do is um, select mini will give you the flat portion. And as part of you do the select mini, you could actually do the mapping logic in there as well. But that'd be about the closest I can think of. 
And Devin's saying, yeah, so I feel a little bit better on this. I got someone fact checking me real time. So no pressure, right? <laughs> well, he, he was the one who was asking the question. Oh, oh, gotcha. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> now you're going to know the question. Uh, so while uh, Java has all, all, that jazz, all this jazz extension methods, uh, function TR generics, I will beg to differ. Java does not have extension methods in the language itself. You have to go to one of the derivative languages like Groovy or Kotlin to get it. I was waiting for you to kick in on that one. I, I appreciate that. I'm not a yeah. Java expert. <laughs> 15 years of Java experience. So I, I'm not a Java expert, but I was actually on the stream, I had someone about a week or two ago ask about extension methods. So I started digging into the job and like, oh, this is nothing like what I'm used to. So, so it's interesting, and, and we can talk after, so I don't interrupt Cameron, but we can talk about some of the interesting things I've discovered in the last couple of months of learning .NET and comparing it to my experience with Java. Cool. Super glad you're on this call, man. <laughs> Makes my life a little bit easier. So uh, picking back up the thread, right? So we wrote this code that allows you to get all the team names given a list of teams. Let's say that we do this in a lot of places, like all over the place for whatever reason. And we don't want to duplicate this code. We could move this logic into its own class and its own method, but that seems overkill because now you'd have to inject it or make it a static method, whatever. So maybe one thing we do is we actually make this an extension method, right? So we create a static class called delivery team list extensions, right? Using that stack keyword there. And we define this extension method called get team names. And as the uh, person who asked the question earlier about the stack in this, the minute we do this and define this method anywhere in my code base that I have a list of delivery team, I can just say dot get team names and this will work. Pretty handy. I've now cleaned up my code. I don't have it duplicated multiple places and I can have this anywhere I need to. So I was able to extend this type pretty nifty. Okay. So, Awesome, we've got this code, things go on. And you know what? The business wants us to write more stuff. Gosh, don't you hate it when requirements change or you got to implement new stuff at the drop of a hat? So we now need to do this type of logic where it says, hey, we've got this list of delivery teams. We want to know all the team leads involved. So we write some more code that looks a lot like this. Uh, get team lead names. We are going to iterate through teams, get a list of names or get a list of team lead names and return that list, okay? Um, same thing as before, we've duplicated this a couple of times, so we would just make another extension method. So now we've got these two extension methods, get team names and get team lead names. Yeah, they're terrible naming, but you know what? We can always pick that up on the refactor. But let's take a look at these methods. Gosh, they look similar, don't they? Like, if you just ignore some of the naming differences, there's really only one real difference to any of it right there, what the thing we're adding to the list is. You being an astute developer go, well, this is awful. Why am I duplicating all this code if this is really the only thing that's changing? So what's a thing that we could write that says, given a team, give me back some value? The func, right? Let's, let's inject a function into the signature. Let's take a look. So maybe what we do is we create a new extension method called get string values. Now it's an extension method off the list of delivery team, but we've made a small tweak. The second parameter, what this tells us is we've, we're now saying, if you're gonna call get string values, you have to give me some function such that given a delivery team, I give you back a string. And once we do that, we can now call that function here for every delivery team and wherever that function returns, here's what we're gonna to add to that list. And we'll go to the next slide and then we'll pause for questions. So with get string values in place, we can refactor our other two extension methods look something like this. Get team names changes. And instead of doing the for each loop, it says, you know, dot get string values, team such that team dot name using the trick we saw earlier. Pretty nifty. And team lead names does the same thing. The only difference is now is that it's the team dot team lead. But if we look at the difference between the two methods now, the only real difference is the thing that mattered. What are we pulling out of the delivery team? 
and we got to remove 12 lines of duplicated code plus or minus a little bit. So let's pause here for a moment because uh, even though I can't see the conversations, I can see when it highlights like someone's putting something in the chat. Chad, you might be on mute, buddy. <laughs> ah. makes, me, makes me feel better. Now, we, now we've done it. We've traded. We've traded a little bit. Uh, the best part is I just had to click one button and it unmutes me, but it uh, doesn't help when I also accidentally move the slider as I'm clicking the button. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there was a question from, uh, from Twitch, so, uh, which was a general question maybe for the end, but uh, is there any particular reason uh, to use the explicit data type in the declaration of a variable uh, instead of just using uh, the keyword var? In the are you ref oh um so it's, it's basically she declared a very clear the type or she use a var oh um six one half dozen other does not matter um that if you need a general rule of thumb uh, be explicit in the type if the variable name or the way you're using the variable doesn't make the type explicit yeah I mean um, so Devin was saying yeah you know, for readability you know, probably using the type is is probably a little bit better I don't know I I, I know that's a that's a debate I go on for for a lot. Um, the way I usually answer that question is if that's what we're squabbling about, our code must be in a really good shape. If, <laughs> yeah. If, that, if that's what we're spinning our cycles on, right? Like that's a good problem to have. So let's have this conversation. Here's where I would say that there's a problem. Like if you're calling a method and it's returning a value and you're assigning it to var and the method doesn't make it clear what the return type is, that's probably a good time to be explicit in your declaration. Absolutely. But if you're just doing var of type A, var name equals you know, I enumerable list of type blah, it's it's probably clear enough. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, any other questions, Chad, or can we, we good to uh, uh, keep rolling? Nope, that, that was oh, what it was. Excellent, cool. All right, so uh, last we left our intrepid developers, we had refactored uh, get team lead names and get team names to use as get string values. So what what else could be going on here? So, man, the business sometimes can be so interesting because they keep giving you these requirements. So now they're like, well, we know the delivery teams, but now we want to know how many people are on each delivery team. So we make sure we don't make one delivery team too big, right? You don't want to have a team of 20 people because you're never going to get anything done. So you're like, all right, third time's the charm. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to write another extension method called get team count. And we're going to go through each of the teams and we're just going to get the member count added to it. So we do that and that works and, you know, hurrah. But once again, we're astute developers. So we kind of look at this and go, can we do this a little bit better? So we write another extension method called get int values and, you know, do the same funk uh, refactor trick we did before. So now we've got get string values and get int values. But when we look at this, man, this looks similar, don't it? In fact, it looks so similar that maybe really the only difference are the types. Huh, imagine that. So what's something that we've seen tonight that allows us to parameterize types? Generics, right? So let's refactor to use a generic here. So now we've got this method called map and we're gonna introduce this generic called uh, T result. And what this says is that if you give me a list of delivery teams and some function that knows how to go from a delivery team to some other type, and we're gonna to refer to that type as T result, I'll give you back a list of T results. So once we have that in play and we refactor get int values and get string values to use this, their definitions are exactly the same. So guess what? We don't need them anymore. We can just get rid of it. And now this is what our get team names and get team lead names and get team count looks like. Teams.map and then whatever the funk is. We just got we just got rid of a whole crap ton of code. And as we and as every time we're doing the refactor, we're preventing more and more mistakes from happening. Right? Once we consolidate it down to the single uh, implementation for each loop. We got rid of someone coding the loop slightly differently each time. Once we introduce the funk in there, we now put the business rules where we can define this a little bit easier. Now that we've went to map and using a generic type, 
I can't really mess up this implementation much more, right? Because given a delivery team, I have to give you back some value. The most I can do now to really throw a wrench in your plans is return you back null or start chucking exceptions. But if you are going to do that to me, you could have done that to me all the way at the beginning. There's nothing I could have done, right? But here comes the fun part. Is there any reason why we need to constrain this to only work on list of delivery teams? No, absolutely not. In fact, uh, the, the most generic version of map looks something like this, where instead of working on the list of delivery teams, we parameterize that list and say, we just work on a T source. So this says that if you give me a list of something, some, some type of T source, and a function that goes from T source to T result, I'll give you back a list of T result. Pretty nifty. What's really cool about this implementation is that if you compare it to the .NET version of it, holy snap, that looks awfully similar. Almost identical, and it has to, right? Because remember what one of the properties of uh, map was, it has to maintain the same number of items. So I can't add any, I can't remove any. Well, once I get into generic types, I just can't create T source from nothing. I can't create T result from nothing. I know nothing about those types. I can't say they're null because maybe the types are uh, integers. I can't say they're zero because zero is not a valid value for like a delivery team. So as we make this code more generic, I am preventing, we're preventing developers from making mistakes. So it can only really work one way. Now, for those playing along at home, realize that this method I've got from GitHub says to list and not select. The reason why I did that is because um, in the link implementation, they have performance um, tuning depending on what type it is under the hood. So if it's a list, it does code a little bit differently because it can use this for each in a list, right? Because it knows it's a list under the hood. But in reality, you didn't have to do it this way. You could actually, instead of limiting it to list, you could attach it directly to the I enumerable type. Now it works for all I enumerables, whether it's a list, dictionary, even your own custom I enumerable like trees and graphs, this would work. And the only difference we had to do is instead of adding things to a list, we're going to use uh, this yield keyword. Yield return is how you lift something into an I enumerable, but this would always work. Maybe not always the most performant thing, but this would fundamentally work. So I saw uh, a little bit of highlighting. So let's pause here for some questions. Chad, what, what do we got in the chat? Uh, let's see here. Um, so Devin was saying uh, another nice aspect of these fluent APIs is that they read more like plain language. Yep, absolutely. Um, and he's just saying list.wherefunc uh, select func. Okay, nice. Yep, you got it. Uh, I don't know why I should feel about you wanting to write code that looks like English. How dare you? <laughs> okay. So we essentially derived map and we kind of did it through refactoring. And like I said, no tricks up my sleeve, anything crazy. So when you want to go from a collection of one type to another, you're going to want to use map. Like I said, in .NET, it's known as select, but in most other languages like JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, Pascal's, your, all of that, it's going to be map, almost guarantee it. So let's take a look at the next one. Keeping what's needed with keep. So, um, uh, so in C sharp and link, it's known as the way it's known as where, and this is actually one of the times I actually think Microsoft got it on the nose with where, um, a lot of other languages will call it filter. And I hate that word because you don't know if it's filtering it in or filtering it out. So where makes it a little bit more clear and keep also makes it clear. So what's cool about this method is that it gives you a subset of a collection based on a predicate, a predicate that says, given some value return back a Boolean. Uh, for those uh, who've been in .NET for a while, will actually remember that predicate is an actual .NET type. That's an actual thing. So if you're using either where or keep, there's a lot of properties you get for free. One of them is that the collection you get back is always between zero and whatever its original length was. Guarantee it. So if you give me a list of zero items, it's always going to be zero. If you give me a list of 20 items, it's somewhere between zero and 20. It doesn't magically find you a new item to add to your list. 
That's pretty powerful. There's a couple more. It can't give you items that weren't in the original list. So if I've got the numbers one through 20 and I do a wear or a keep on it, the number 42 can't show up in the list. Wasn't in there to begin with. Another fun thing you get for free with uh, filt, uh, with keep or wear is that it also maintains the order. So if I've got the numbers one through 20 and I'm filtering it only on evens, it's going to give me two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, not two, 18, six, 20. That's a lot of cool things you get for free just for using this method. So let's take a look at how we can write this. All right. So here's our delivery team one more time. Right. And we just talked about that. We were wanting to find out which teams had maybe too many members on it. So which delivery teams have more than seven members. So we could write some code like this. So I've short circuited uh, a little bit of the refactor, went ahead and did this as an extension method, but we have some method that says um, too big of teams. You give me a list of teams. I'll iterate through the list. And, if in, and for each one that's got more than seven, I'm going to return you back that team. And I've already short circuited this to use the I enumerable because you've seen us do this refactor. Okay, so we've got this going. So once again, we're gonna write some more code because now we want to find out which delivery teams have Dana as a team lead because we shouldn't have one team lead on like leading multiple teams. That could be a bit much. I don't know about you, but I've got uh, one team of three uh, to four devs depending on the day and that can be stressful. So having to manage more of those could be rough, right? So how would we write this code? Well, we'd write something like this, right? We'll go through uh, each of the teams and if the lead's equal to Dana, we'll return back that team. Well, we've got these two extension methods and if we squint at them, man, they look similar, don't they? Real similar. In fact, maybe the only difference is what we're doing this if check on. Could we parameterize that somehow? You bet we can use a func here. So maybe we create a method called get teams by, and maybe it's not the best name, but we'll go with it. And instead of just working on a list of teams or an I enumerable of teams, it takes in another parameter as well, we call predicate that says, given a delivery team, I will return back true or false, some Boolean value. And now in our if check, instead of it being very team specific, we just call this predicate. And if the predicate returns true, return back team, and if it returns false, it won't return anything for that. It won't return that team at all. This is why uh, filter can be somewhat interesting because the only other way you could write this code is to do not predicate, which would accidentally throw out all the things that you wanted, which is why filter is a really bad name for this. So with get teams by in existence, we can actually refactor our other two extension methods to use it. So get too big of teams says, well, teams get teams by, you know, more than seven members. And then for Dana, it's uh, for the other extension method, it's teams such that the team leads equal to Dana. And we get to now ax all the rest of that code. Pretty cool. So let's take a look at get teams by again one more time. Given this code, is there any reason why it has to be limited to delivery team? Anything in here that's specific to a delivery team? No, no, not really. In fact, we can parameterize the types because if you take a look at the generic implementation using T source and the original, the only difference is are those types. Pretty neat. So once we parameterize it, we've now got keep says, I don't care if you give me a list of any or any a collection of any type and a function that goes from that type to Boolean, keep will work. It'll do exactly what you want. Nice. And if we compare our solution to the .NET solution, it looks pretty similar. Once again, um, when you do uh, where it's got some performance um, kind of uh, performance tuning to it. So if it knows that you're to listing the, the collection, it'll actually run where this way versus a different way. But the logic's essentially the same, right? If predicate add it to the thing to return. And once again, it kind of has to do it this way. There's no other implementations of this such that it maintains the order, it can't give you additional items, and it can't give you, um, um, right, or sorry, th those are really the big ones. Um, 
And the only other way you could have written this code to maintain all those properties is like I said before, if you inverted the predicate check, like you said, not predicate. Otherwise, there's no other way you could have done this. Pretty cool. Any more questions, comments in the chat at this point, Chad? Uh, I have yeah, a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, can you use this kind of pattern with unbounded streams, like from a message queue in .NET? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you could, as long as the stream uh, implements the ienumerable interface, this would work. Because it, the, the trick with ienumerable is that the only thing you've got to work with is it gives you back this thing known as an enumerator. And so whatever, so if you've got a stream and that stream implements ienumerable and you've defined that enumerator to work on like that, that batching or that getting that item from the stream, link all, all of the stuff would work because it's being hidden by that enumerator abstraction. That enumerator is also why the for each thing works the way it does. Like that's why I can get away with that. That's a great question. All right, Chad's not yelling other questions at me. Devin, I think as uh, his curiosity has been satisfied for at least 20 seconds. So let's, let's keep the ball rolling. <laughs> so the big thing with using keep or where is that you wanna keep the data that you want. That's the big thing to keep in mind here, right? Last but not least, Let's take a look at reduce. So I'm not gonna lie, reduce is probably the hardest one to grok, but once you've got it, a lot of things start making sense. So the idea of reduce is that you're gonna go from many things to one thing. So imagine taking all these eggs and making an omelet out of it. If that kind of made sense to you, then you know what reduce does. Uh, in .NET, it's known as aggregate. Um, so it, for those playing along at home. So what reduce or aggregate does is if you give it a collection, some initial value to start with, and a combiner function, and I'm being very vague about that, it will take that collection and narrow it down to a single value. So an implementation of such a thing may look something like this, where uh, my initial value for adding numbers is zero because if the list is empty, it's zero. I've defined a func that says, if you give me two integers, I'll return you back a new integer called add, and I'm just gonna give you A and B. And then aggregate works by literally passing in that initial value and then a way to combine the initial value with something in the list. Confusing, right? I promise it's not too bad. Let's take a look at some examples. So let's say that we wanted to know how many team members we have in total for the department, right? So we're gonna go through all the delivery teams and add up their member counts. So we'd write code that looks something like this. And for those of you who've been developing any period of time, like, yeah, we're doing a running total, no big surprise, right? Nothing crazy. Okay, and so once again, I've short-circuited, used extension methods and all of that. So there's, there's nothing crazy going on here. And let's say that because we have new requirements, we also want to uh, format the teams to be a particular way, like we want to build up a list, like we, or not build up a list, but we want to build up a string to present. So we go, all right, well, uh, we'll use a string builder. We'll iterate through the teams and we'll append a line to the string builder and return back that string builder. Now, both these methods look very different, right? One's using string builders and append lines. The other one's using integers and plus equal. But what if I told you the there's already a pattern here? It's already in existence. Let's look at it. Both of these start with some initial value. They both iterate through a list of things. And then they both take whatever their initial value is and update it somehow. In one case, it's by plus equal. In the other case, it's doing a pin line, but still modifying it. When you find yourself writing code that looks something like this, you've actually got reduce. That's exactly what you've done. And so if we were to refactor this such that we could use the same pattern, you would end up with a method that looks like this. And my apologies, this is an awful looking piece of code, but we'll go through it. So the big thing is that in one case, we have to return back an integer. In the other case, we need to return back a string builder. So based on that alone, that tells us we need to genericize the return type. So that's where T result comes from. And in fact, in both cases, we also know that's the same type as our initial value, which is where this comes from. Now, the, the trick is actually this part, which says, if you give me a T result and some delivery team, I'll give you back another T result. But once you've got that reducer function, your code looks kind of similar, 
right? We've got this T result of the initial value. As we iterate through each team in the list, we're going to reduce and say, given this result in a team, here's your new result. And once we're done processing through the whole list, here's your result, here's your final result back. Okay, well, we've got this reduce method. Let's, let's take a look at refactoring to use this thing. So for the total number of employees, we set our initial value to zero. Our reducer function is something that says int delivery team to int. So we have a total and a team and we just say total. There's a small typo here. It's supposed to be total plus team, but funny enough, total plus equal still works as well, um, but equal member count. And then we just call reduce with the initial value of zero and then that reducer. Not too bad. The string builder with the team names is something very similar. The initial value is that string builder of team and uh, teams in the company. Our reducer function is something that says, given a string builder and delivery team, here's a new string builder. So in our case, it's sb.append line, but it's essentially what we were doing before. And now we can use return teams.reduce. We can use that method now. So with making the uh, reduce function, and making it slightly generic, we're able to clean up, I think roughly 12 to 15 lines of code. Pretty nifty. How are we doing so far? Like I don't hear any screeching of brakes or wheels falling off, so I think we're doing okay. No, you, you, you are getting a uh, digging it. All oh, right. Uh, hopefully not digging a hole. Hopefully I'm not digging myself a hole, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we're getting. I told you the humor's getting worse. Humor's getting worse. On Twitch, you're getting uh, happy and concentrated. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Chad. All right. So let's take a look back at the reduce method for a minute. So here's what we had before. And I get to ask another fun question. Is there any reason why this has to work on delivery team only? No, there's absolutely not. There's not a single reason why this is limited delivery team. All we have to do all we have to, man, I'm speaking like a product manager. All you have to do, it's just this. All we have to do is parameterize instead of delivery team, anywhere that said delivery team, just use T-source and this would work, which is pretty cool. Now here comes something really interesting. I can't have both these on the same slide, but so this is the version of reduce we came up with. Here's the legitimate version of aggregate from the GitHub of, 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 of .NET. If you were to ignore the if checks at the beginning, it's the same code. It's the exact same code. And it has to be, <laughs> once again, because I have all those properties, right? It's gotta reduce it down to a single value. It's got, it has to be this way because you don't know anything about the types. You can't create this stuff out of nothing, which is pretty cool. Because I imagine there's some really smart engineers that work at Microsoft that did this stuff. Probably a fair assumption. So it's kind of interesting that we're able to derive this same thing or close to it just by following these properties and by refactoring using extension methods, by using generics, by using this func data type. So long story short, if you find yourself wanting to transform a collection down to a single value, you gotta first identify the initial value. And once you do that, write this combining logic. And once you've done that, you can use reduce, which is pretty cool but I've got one more trick up my sleeve. It's the only trick I've got. We're gonna reduce link, all the stuff we've implemented in link so far, we're gonna reduce it down to only using reduce. And you're like, what? What, what, do, you, what do you mean, Cameron? No, I'm being serious. Uh, we're gonna rewrite map and we're gonna rewrite keep to use reduce only. And you're, you're like, serious? I'm like, yeah, oh yeah. You can actually rewrite all of link to just use reduce all of it. Um, I'm not going to lie. Some of them get a little bit more interesting, like group by group by is a fun one, but I'll give you the generic algorithm that you, oh crap. I can't use the word generic now. Cause now it's got a loaded phrase. I'll give you the algorithm you can use to figure out how to write something uh, to use aggregate or reduce. So the trick for all of these is that you've got to figure out what the initial value is. Most of the time it is what happens when the list you're working with or the collection is empty. Once you've got a, once you've got that figured out, You've now got to come up with this combining function that says, well, given that initial value and something that is in the collection, how do I, how do I make these types work? Let me show you. So here's good old map, right? Good old, good old map. So there's two questions we got to ask. 
what's the initial value, right? Which is, and then, you know, like I was kind of mentioning before, what would we return if the list or the collection we're working on was empty? What would we return here? No one's shouting, so I'll, I'll help you out. We'd give back an empty list, an empty enumerable. So this is the one spot I'm cheating a little bit because the empty method does come from the link namespace. You can write your own, it's only two lines, but I didn't want to have to you, uh, throw more code at you because I think I'm probably hitting my limit somewhere close. So this is why I'm cheating, but you can write your own version. So once we've got empty, that's our initial value. So boom, we're already halfway done. So if I were, if so if this is my map via reduce method that I just created, this is all boilerplate. So it's got to keep the same signature as map did. So that's how the first part of this method got generated. And since we're using reduce, that's what uh, the return there is what's doing. It's doing source.reduce. I know what my initial value is. That's the first parameter. And then I've got this reducer part and I've left that intentionally blank. So once I do that, I can literally do control period on my keyboard and Visual Studio will helpfully tell me, oh, hey, you want to generate that type here? Let me help you. Here's roughly what it's got to look like. So this is the trick. If I can figure out how to write the reducer function such that this code compiles, it will work. How often have you gotten saved that in your career? If it compiled, it worked. Okay. And so what do we need to do? Well, to make this type signatures work out, we've got two steps. We got to first convert the item in that func from a T, which is what it is now, to a T result. So we got to change its type. And then the second thing we got to do is we got to append this item to the list. We got to, we got to or append it to the uh, collection of values, the I enumerable. Well, the cool thing is converting from that T to a T result is pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, we got, we got handed that for free with our map definition, right? We were given a select function, right? Something that knows how to go from T to T results. So let's use it. Well, dang it, that was supposed to be the hard part. And the definition just, and the definition of map gave us that for free. So now the next part is, well, crap, we've now got to, uh, and sorry, and so that's where we convert it. But now we've got to actually add it to the, um, to the list. We got to add it to the collection. So how do we do that? We just call values.append. This is me cheating again. Append does come from link, but if you take a look at the definition, all it does is it iterates through whatever the collection was. And then once it's done, it does yield return the next item. So if you really want to smack me on the wrist for using link, you can, but it's another one of those two line methods that you could have written. I don't want to drown you all in more code because like I said, I think I'm hitting my limit. But this is it. Once this code's in place, map via reduce gives you the same properties, same things as map does. Pretty nifty. So what does uh, keep look like in this, in such a way? So here's what we had for keep originally, right? Go through uh, the collection. If the predicate matches yield return. So we get to ask the questions. What should we return if the list is empty? If there's nothing in the collection? Probably an empty enumerable again, right? We can use that trick. Okay, so once we do that, we end up writing code like this again. So we've got keep via reduce. It's got to have the same type signature. And we know what the last bit's going to be. It's going to be source.reduce. So I use that trick, control period, give me the stub. And it says, yep, this is what you got to write. And I'm like, crap. Okay, I've got to figure out how to give it an I enumerable of T and some T to give you back another I enumerable of T. Well, the way we'd have to write this is two steps. One, we got to check to make sure that the item that's being passed in meets the criteria, i.e. the predicate is true. And if it does meet the predicate, we need to append it to values. Okay, well, if we start doing that, code's going to look a little bit like this. We can do an if on the predicate, right? So if predicate of item, that tells us it matches, right? This part right here, if predicate of item tells us it matches, else it didn't match. So if it matches, we say values.append item. And if it doesn't match, we just give you back whatever values was. We just skip over that item. But this will do it. So at this point, you all have drunk from the fire hose of a lot of stuff tonight. 
a lot, a lot of things. So let's let's do a small recap here. And actually, before I do the recap, I should really ask Chad. Chad, I just threw a lot of code at people in like five seconds. It felt like. What what questions do we have in the chat, if any? Uh, no questions, but you did get a comment that. Uh, um... Oh, okay. Hold on. Yeah, you can come with uh, very good, even with stuck viewing on the phone the whole time. Even with what? Uh, uh, viewing on the phone the whole time. Oh, so someone, someone's watching on, on Twitch on the phone the whole time, and it's still oh. getting a lot out of out of your session. Nice. Well, that's wonderful news. Excellent. Man, I should present here more often, Chad. All all your audience is nice and friendly, and Devin's the only one that's been throwing me real hard questions like. Ah, Cameron, what do you think about this esoteric thing that you know nothing about? I was like, I don't know. I think it's this. <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all good. So you've you've learned all these concepts and you've rewritten like map, reduce, and keep and all the stuff. So let's let's wrap up, right? So we covered link, we covered all these fundamentals, and you implemented all the stuff, right? I, I'm not going to lie. A lot of this stuff probably is not going to stick for you, right? This is something you're going to put some time, some energy into it to really understand, to really grok what it's doing. But if you got nothing else out of this session, uh, as Chad put it, here's your big takeaways. Link isn't magic. It's not some black box sitting over there in the corner where you can't figure out what it's doing, right? All it is, it's a composition of these three things, funks, generics, and extension methods. And you can derive your own version of link that's pretty darn close to what Microsoft does just by doing refactoring, right? We kept refactoring to be less code, less code, more generic, more extensible, and so we derived it. But really, a lot of this stuff is coming from the fact that we're building these bigger programs from smaller programs. And once we do this, we can start composing a little bit more. And this idea of com composition, building bigger programs from smaller programs is actually what functional programming is all about. So on that note, if you're like Cameron, I need to know more. I want to know more about all this stuff. Here's some articles that I would recommend some good resources. Um, JavaScript map reduce and filter, uh, the JavaScript array function explained with code examples is actually a pretty darn good write-up um, from, I think it's free code camp. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend that. Um, if you're wanting all the code that we did tonight, um, you can go to my GitHub, level up with link, and you can download it, look at it, poke at it, tell me Cameron, your code sucks, do a little bit better. And I'll be like, yeah, probably. Right. So with that being said, uh, let's have some questions. Uh, you can ask them here. If you're like, Cameron, I don't want to ask you questions in this setting. I'll be like, that's cool. Send me an email. And if you want to give me feedback, right? Like, let's say you want to do an anonymous, whatever, do me a favor, scan this QR code and it'll take you to a one question Google Forms doc where you can tell me right then and there how you thought I did. And if you wanna you know, tell me like, Cameron, you're the worst presenter ever, you can, you can totally do that. Uh, and if you feel so brave, you can drop some contact info and we can chat more about it. But otherwise, thank you all so much for letting me speak tonight. And uh, let's open up the floor for questions. Cameron, I just realized you were the, uh... You were the blackjack dude that presented a couple years ago. Yes. <laughs> that blew my mind. And I wondered, uh, I, I didn't make the connection until I saw your uh, your GitHub site. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my so goodness. You, so, so we do remember, or at least I remember you. I was very impressed with what you did with Funks. I, had, I still don't quite understand it, but that was, <laughs> that was a cool call. Thanks. Um, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Little plots from the past there. <laughs> also, I have someone on Twitch who remembers that talk. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, uh, you all may appreciate this. I've actually overhauled that talk and to make it a little bit more streamlined uh, to, to hit some more of these concepts a little bit more. So uh, nice. I, I'm glad to see that stuck that, out. That one would actually bear repeating. If, if, if you've updated that talk, uh, I would definitely sit in on it and try again with it for, for my own sake. Cool. Well, thanks for the feedback there. Uh, Chad, you've got a request from the audience, my man. Yeah, yeah we can definitely talk about that. <laughs> there you do have another question on uh, Twitch. Yeah. So, uh, okay, just a question about the last example. Mm -hmm. Adding a new item uh, to the enumerable object passed as a parameter is 
is not one of the functional programming rules being violated. Sweet. So it isn't because if you take a look at how that um, append method works, it's actually creating a brand new I enumerable every time. So typically adding an item to a list and mutating it is essentially what, what I'm reading out of that question. It's generally not a good thing, um, but if you take a look at the implementation for append, it's not appending it to a list. It's literally creating a brand new collection every time. So, but that's a good point to, uh, to call out. Um, also something else to keep in mind too, um, functional programming gets the rap that um, you can never mutate things. Mm, not true. What you wanna do is if you do have to mutate it, you wanna make that scope as narrow as possible. Um, even languages that kind of say they don't do immutability like Haskell, Haskell can actually will support that when, when and if it's needed. Mm -hmm. um, and other uh, purely functional languages will do that too. You usually have to opt into it. So, I, so that person responded, you know, oh, awesome, thanks. And then another comment, uh, uh, oh, so it's uh, like map in JS, in JavaScript. Yes, so select and map is exactly. That, that's exactly why I use the, the word map is because if you work in other languages besides C Sharp, the ability to go from a collection type to another is like 9% of the time it's known as map. Um, I've been asked the question like, why in the heck did Microsoft call it select? If I had to take a guess, it's so that it lines up with SQL a little bit cleaner because when you work with link, a, a really common use case is linked to SQL. So you can actually use the select keyword. That, that's my assumption there, but I can't, I can't verify that. Good questions. Well, one of the things that uh, came across my desk, I'm, I'm a new developer, by the way, I'm just three years in the industry, I'm not very experienced at all, but one of the things that came across my desk was a <clears throat> link query to a SQL database. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a select and a dot include and which got scripted as a left join. Mm -hmm. The database results, set, the results set coming back from the database included rows that had null linkages. But as soon as it hit, as soon as it got converted for internal consumption, that is the, the relational to option, uh, object mapping, mm -hmm. those rows were dropped. Mm -hmm. And so uh, sometimes the uh, apparently uh, the intersection between how the database handles the query and how the object relational mapping wants to handle it. And I see I see Devin pointing to his to his skull there. Uh, it just it well we wound up with a broken API point, or at least the backing query to an API point. And now we have to figure out, well, did we set that up wrong? Uh, you know, it just, le it just left a, a, a question. Yeah, so generally, for, so if you were getting away with that, right, you're probably doing the, um, there's an I queryable happening there, right? Because that's why I was able to take your link and turn it into a SQL statement, right? That's right. And, and of course, it got reified, you know, there was a, a, a to list. And so right. it became, it became an object. And it was at apparently uh, you know, before the two list, the mm -hmm. results set had those rows. After the two list, those rows were just taken out. Yeah, so what may be happening there is that there may be something in the I, so I queryable at the end of the day also implements I enumerable. So because it implements that interface, you get all that link stuff for free, but there's nothing preventing the I queryable implementation. And this is me taking a guess, right? It's me taking a guess. There may be something in the I queryable uh, implementation that filters out null rows like that, maybe by, by using a coalesce statement or just by filtering it out. I'm not sure. Okay, and and also it might have been in the way we built the you know the on model. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Hey, Chad, you might be on mute, buddy. 
now we're even because I've done it twice. You've done it twice. Now we're now we're square. Now now we've done. See, square. now I'm just forgetting. It, it, it's not like <laughs> I, not like I thought I unmuted. I just forgot to unmute. So, no, I, I was asking. So, anyone have any other questions? All right, sure enough, anyone on Twitch before uh, before we end the stream? I promise I'm friendly. I don't bite. I, I will try to answer your question. So we'll, we'll continue the social portion, which people can ask more questions on the social portion. I do find sometimes questions happen after I disconnect Twitch. <laughs> so I have there. questions that aren't related to Cameron's talk because you know I'm new to to .NET and Link, and I, I've I've run into some issues, and I'm like, I know how I do this in Java, but how do I do this in .NET? <laughs> Well, sure. No, why, why don't, I mean, uh, why don't we go to that part? Because I'll, I'll keep that on Twitch, because I, I know you're not shy. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, why, why, why don't you start asking some of those questions? Sure. So, um, just to set a little context, I am a consulting architect with Red Hat's Cloud Native Runtimes Practice. Uh, we help our customers move their workloads to Kubernetes in the cloud. And some of the workloads we're being asked to help with a lot lately are .NET and helping customers move from .NET framework, which is end of life or pretty close to end of life, according to Microsoft, to .NET core in containers on Kubernetes. And so I've had to ramp up and learn .NET. I've kind of avoided .NET for years because almost everything I've ever done has been on Linux and Unix. And until recently, .NET didn't run on Linux and Unix. Now that it does, Hey, it's it's actually a nice language. It's uh, I, I really had very few issues learning the language. It's uh, just getting used to the frameworks, mostly learning the libraries like ASP.NET and Web API and things like that. Uh, how .NET does dependency injection for is another one. But so let me ask this question, right? I have a let me see if I can actually share this code in an easy manner. Uh, I have a web API project. Uh, can I turn on Zoom in Writer? That's the next question. Uh, Zoom is so different from all the other IntelliJ tools. Is it window.zoom? No, general. It always makes me feel good when someone else is running into technical difficulties as well. <laughs> like, how do I juggle all the tech? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, are you, are in you all of the other it? IntelliJ tools like PyCharm, Web, WebStorm, uh, IdeaJ, and all that, there's an option that says if you use your scroll wheel, it'll zoom in on the text or zoom out on your text. And that option isn't there in Writer, which is the the Linux version of like Visual Studio from IntelliJ. Um, I wonder if Control Shift Plus would work. No, what about Control Scroll? No. Okay, so let me do this. I'm gonna make this window. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Actually, it did zoom. It just took a few seconds. Oh, and now my, okay. All right, here's the deal. Let me share this window real quick if I can. Oh, oh, Chad, you'll have to give me permission to share my screen. Yeah, just a second here. There you go. You should be able to share now. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me select a window. Yep, here we go. All right. So I have an endpoint that returns an action result of list of employee and it, it's, it's allowing for pagination and filtering of the results, mm -hmm. right? So I'm building a filter predicate. And what I want to do is when they pass like a filter and filter by, filter by is the field in the table, filter is the value I want to filter on, similar sort by and uh, is the field in the table that I want to sort by. And so far, I've only found a way to do this with link by using like this kind of ugly switch statement. 
how can I put like a uh, just a generic like if I wanted to just use that filter variable to choose, is there a cleaner way to do this? Uh, oh goodness. So the problem, so your hangup is right. If it's name, you want it from the name property, and if it's ID, you want it from the ID property, right? Right. Yeah. So that's so that's actually your pivot point. So you could do. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna read your code here, and I'm gonna to try to troubleshoot this and not be stupid, um, which means I'm gonna fail miserably on both guards. Uh, I promise to not read code though. Um, so, is filter predicate only ever gonna be one thing, or are you iterating this over uh, a collection of stuff? This is a collection of employees. Sh sure, but like, is the filter predicate getting ended, ended, ended all the way through? Is that what's happening here? Uh, so. Pretty close. It, it's here's the beginning of it. We're starting with that filter predicate, and we're using. Uh, I've got a uh, an auto mapper that sure. translates employee entities, the database object, to an employee DTO or an employee view type. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've got a repository, uh, which is basically just a thin shim on top of Entity Framework. So gotcha. in the repository, I say query the page, which allows me to set, you know, the, the start and offset. Mm -hmm. And I pass the filter predicate to that query page. Gotcha. And the filter predicate is true and whatever it gets out of this switch statement. And then the order by is a different thump. So it really is just true and this in okay. the filter predicate. Okay. So let's so I don't know how to make all this link, but there's some there's some code quality stuff we could do to simplify this a bit. So I'm sure. Oh, right, because we're we're hacking together, right? <laughs> so one thing that comes to my mind is if you do if you got a predicate and its default's true, and then you've got the switch that's always going to add something to it, why not just have filter predicate equal and then do um, a ternary? And just set it that way. Um, uh, personally, I find ternaries to be an anti-pattern. They they reduce readability. Um, okay, uh, I look at ternaries and say it forces you to handle both the if and the else, but to each their own. Okay, so another thing you could do then instead is you can instead of doing the dot and why not put a func on the employee entity? So you could have a func that says because uh, I imagine the type signature of the thing on the right is a Boolean, right? E.name.contains. So you could have a func. E yes. Yeah. So you could have a func um, that func of employee entity to Boolean, call that func um, name contains filter, a second func called, uh, you know, ID contains that has the same signature. And then your switch statement, all it does is it give, tells you which func to use. Then after that, so, you can say filter predicate dot and whatever func, and that should work. I see where you're going there. Now, imagine that I have to use this same pattern like 20 different times in this application for different entity types and the different DTOs. I would like to try and find sort of a generic replacement that will work on any of these entities. Okay, so what do all those entities have in common then? Because that, that's what you got to think about. The only thing they have in common is that they're annotated to tell us what the uh, um, primary key is. So would you say then, okay, so I'm trying to think about how you could genericize this. One, this is, and I'm spitballing here. A terrible idea is you could have a dictionary that goes from a uh, filter by into the funk that you'd want based on the filter by one approach. Um, and then that, that would give you your lookups. That's essentially what you're doing here to my, in, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for more of a generic way though, you would either have to just use any type and then figure out a way to make that work. Or if you know a little bit more about the type, you can put some constraints on the generic and say like, oh, it's any T as long as it's like inherited from this class or it has this interface right. implementation. So, I mean, to give you an example, the, the employee entity, 
the primary key in the employee entity is a good, or sorry, is actually a, a user ID string. Sure. Uh, but when I go to apply that to say the list of skills, the primary key is a good. And so I'm, I'm looking for, you know, some, that's the, really the only thing that's common is this key annotation. Uh, the types, the names can all be different. And, and maybe it's just not something you, you can do easily in link. Uh, well, so in, in, in say Java, I would use J JPA query language and I would just do a string substitution inside the query. I mean, you could uh, you could do that as well. I mean, if you're just switching out strings like substrings in a query, you can totally do that in C sharp, um, right? So that that's one approach. Yeah, but it's not really type safe. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing you do is that's one of the big things I've noticed is C sharp is a lot more type safe than Java uh, because Java came about much earlier and when it first started out, it didn't have generics and Backward compatibility is important to them, so they couldn't easily add generics. And so actually generics get erased at runtime in Java. So here's your other terrible idea. You could use reflection, interrogate the type to see if it had any attributes with the key attribute on it. And then so you'd write, you would have to write a function that would go from any type, interrogate it via reflection, to figure out if yeah. it had any property, and then it would return back that property. I was afraid that you were going to say it was going to take reflection. <laughs> OK. Well, so you can do it that way. Or your other approach, right? if you didn't want to do it that way, but I don't like this one as much, is you could, you've got a partial class there for most of the stuff. You could extend your partial class, force it to have an interface, and that interface dictates you to have to define what the primary key is. And then your generic and then your um, funk, or sorry, your generic type constraint would be any object that has that interface. And if it's got that interface, you know what the primary key is. But that also doesn't seem like a great approach so, because that can get out of sync. And this is where one of my other problems would, would rear its ugly head. 90% of this code is generated by a code generator. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm using Open API Generator to generate most of this from an Open API spec. Uh, so all these models, the the controller abstract classes are all generated code, and so I really shouldn't touch those. What I can do is I can modify the the mustache templates that I generate from. Well, so so you're correct that you shouldn't touch these, but remember, some of those classes are partial classes. So are you familiar with what a partial class is in C Sharp? Nope. OK, so a partial class in C Sharp means that you can have that class defined over multiple files. So you could put your logic in a file that doesn't get generated, that that wouldn't get oh, replaced nice. if you regenerate it. So that, that that's approach number two. Right, and, and most, most uh, code generators, that's what they do. They, they use partial classes for that purpose. So here's the question, right? So like in my, my git ignore, I'm ignoring this entire controllers folder. Or I'm ignoring this entire models folder. Can I put the, the rest of the partial class in a separate folder and still absolutely. have it associate with the namespaces correctly? Yeah, absolutely. So I just define the namespace at the top of the file and maybe create a new... Uh, new directory called model extensions or model uh, interfaces. Yeah, exactly. As long as it's in the, I think the namespace has to be the same, but you can make the namespace be whatever. But regardless, that, that this is totally a known problem. This is a known solution. You can easily Google this in like 10 seconds and get this going. Um, and in fact- and No, you can't because I've been Googling it for days. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about the partial class thing. The partial class is something you can Google oh, okay. in like 10 seconds or less. No, no, no. Sorry, that's a good point. But that partial class trick is so well known in .NET because that's how WinForms works under the hood. That's how WPF works under the hood. So, um, okay. yeah. So that would probably be one approach you could take that wouldn't involve reflection. Yeah, because, I mean, when I looked at this, yes, this, is, this works fine. And it's probably plenty performant. 
it's just ugly and you know requires writing a lot of the same code over and over and over again and that always seems like a smell to me yeah sure absolutely yeah okay now, I, yeah. I will take a look at, at extending the partial classes then and see if i can maybe uh genericize this some way uh a small plug. It's it's kind of a shame you're not in Visual Studio or VS Code because then we could have paired this. We could have, we could have totally knocked this out super quick. Uh, I can load this in VS Code and do a live share. Sure, let's do it. Let's let, let's do it live, man. Let's get this going. All right, let me uh, release my share. Oh, hey. uh, how do I turn off sharing? <laughs> <laughs> you did turn off sharing. Oh, I did? OK. Yep. Cool. So let me load that up in VS Code. The reason I don't use VS Code is is Writer has much better debuggers. Oh, sure. And I'm now. I lost you. Yeah, camera's frozen. Don't worry. It's just it's, it's one of those like, oh, yeah, we could totally. Can you even hear me? Yeah, you're uh, back. No, you froze for a few moments. You're back now. All right. So if I share up oh, my brown, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, yeah, there we go. Share screen. And Visual Studio Code, allow. And sign in to, oh, no, that's feedback. Uh, Thought I had. Oh, dang, I thought I had that plugin. Oh, actually, I know what it is. Uh, I have profile switcher. I need to switch back to my .NET profile. Oh, I'll do it. Because I was doing, I was doing Java programming earlier, and some of the Java plugins and .NET plugins like to fight over things. Okay, so now, and I still don't have live share. Why do I not have live share? Oh, I guess I never installed it in my VS Code profile. I have pretty much every IDE you can imagine unless it's platform specific. <laughs> uh, because I have to train consultants that work in whatever they feel like so yeah i can uh, understand that yeah so i use on a daily basis i use eclipse netbeans intellij webstorm vs code atom vim uh uh the one, the one I never have been able to get used to is Emacs. I, I just well, that's because you I did don't Vim. rock Emacs. I mean, that's because you did Vim. Like, there's very few people who are like, ah, I can do Vim and Emacs <laughs> both. It's like, nah, nah, nah. That's, that's a that's a war of some sort. Yeah, it doesn't work in your brain. That's for sure. Uh, okay, I need to be authenticated. Uh, live share. Uh, I say you should just be able to Where's start. Sign oh, in sorry. with browser. That's what I need. Give me just a moment. It's all good. It's all good. While we're while we're uh, debugging live share here, uh, what's what's here's what's totally going to happen. We're going to get all this set up, and I'm going to try to join. And either it's going to work smashingly, or it's like, oh yeah, I can only do three of these things because I've got two gerbils for my internet right now. Right, like it's going to be one of these things. Like yeah. All of this setup and like none of the reward. <laughs> well, you know, you might you might need to uh, just uh, cut your video. Oh, that's no fun. But now, okay. yeah, I mean, no it means we won't be able to see you. Ah, oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Let but generally, if I mean, you know, that's the first thing you do when you need to reduce bandwidth. Yeah. All right. There's the, the live share link in the sidebar chat. Man, that's not going to go horribly wrong for anyone. <laughs> eh. All right. So if everything's worked correctly, 
Well, actually, you're actually fine because there's only one other person who sees that because it, that the, the chat does not come across to uh, Twitch. Oh, gotcha. So cool. So and, I've known, and I trust Beth not to do anything bad. I see you. Yeah. So I see you. Yeah. Are you we, sure we, you trust me? I don't know. I don't know if I trust myself. Well, <laughs> every time I've tried to use Live Share lately, though, it's died horribly. Really? Yeah. My problem is during the day, my son's at home doing school online, and his Google Meet is eating up pretty much all my bandwidth. So I'm living on my hotspot on my phone these days. Mm. <laughs> See, it's a crazy thing because, like, I've got gigabit internet at my house, but for some reason, I, I think it has something to do with the uh, authentication or something that, like, my company uses or something. I don't uh, know right off, but, like, every time I try to join a live share, I just get stuck in a login loop. Oh. So I just can't, I can't do anything. Uh, so. That's me. Yeah, no, no, I was just, I, th I thought I had to give you permissions or something, but that's only for the terminal. The link yep. gives permission, yeah. Um, so taking a look at what you got, right, it seems like controllers is where all this stuff that's being created, right? Or is it models that we're wanting to do the partial class on? Models and, well, actually, there, there's very little of this that isn't generated. So the parts that are not generated is uh, data access. Mm-hmm. I, this is basically my, my DB context, except I also wrap it in a, uh, 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 oh wait, I'm, oh crap. I think I'm in the wrong directory. <laughs> I think I'm in the wrong directory. Hold on. Because there's no, there's no implementation directory here. Uh, shoot. What directory did I have open? Hold on. Let me take a look and see what Ryder says. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. So hold on. Let me see if I can do this without disconnecting you. Uh, open uh, if you're, folder. If you're about to change names, uh, workspaces or folders, uh, rip. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, nah, it's cool. It's cool. We'll get this sussed out. Man, is this going to be like anything else, right? Like, it's going to be one of those, like, it'll take 20 minutes to get everything squared away, like, to get everything set up, and then 10 seconds to do the work. Yeah. But it's all good. It's all good. Okay. There we go. All right. So, basically, this is my DB context, but I'm also using this, uh, this entity context base, which gives me generic repository methods. Okay. Uh, so your typical CRUD operations. Right. Okay. So we were talking about, uh, in your case, it was like, it was models, right? That have, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to keep just snooping around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was totally the models that were wanting to extend a little bit with the partial class because you wanted to know what the key is, right? So, right. So here's the employee API implementation. This is where mm -hmm. the ugly switch statement is. I want to figure out how generically for different model types, I can automatically map the filter by field to the entity field. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to think of like, what's the simplest, simplest. You can't see me doing air quotes, but pretend I'm doing air quotes here. So I'm just going to sure. dump something in your models folder here, and we're, we're just going to freehand something, and then we can we can shuffle files around and such. So I'm going to I'm just going to burn sure. your entire repo. I'm, just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. So hey, this is all inversion control. Feel free. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so we're just going to create this interface real quick. Um, I don't know what we're going to call it. Uh, usually we'll start with I, but um, maybe I key definer. Heck, if I know, I'm just going to put something in there. Sure. And we're going to come in here and we're going to say uh, you know, public interface. Oh, crap. There we go. Do, do, do. And it's key definer. And we'll, we'll refine this contract, right? But we'll say something like public string, get key, and you've, and, and that's what it is, right? So nothing super crazy. It's just a basic interface. 
So what we can now, now just FYI, we're not always going to filter or sort by the key. It can be whatever we you can want. Filter or sort. Yeah. Okay. You, I'll say we once again, dude. We're just trying to rough something in, and we'll refactor. Um, gotcha. Uh, the gotcha. odds of me, the odds of us getting this right off the bat are slim to none because I know nothing about your problem, and it sounds like you know about two inches worth of .NET. So <laughs> we'll, meet <somewhere laughs> in the we'll meet somewhere in the middle here. Yeah. So yeah, what yeah, gonna, yeah. yeah. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to create a new uh, C sharp class, and I'm going to call it Employee uh, Key Definer, for lack of a better phrase. And this is terrible naming, right? Totally, totally terrible naming. But it's, it's enough for us to sure. start roughing in a few things. And once VS Code decides to create that file, oh, that's cool. Maybe, I, maybe it did, did it? No, no, maybe, maybe. Employee key definer, no. Okay, well, let me try it a second time. You may end up with like three of these things. Let me knows. try. Did it put it someplace odd? Uh, should have put it in, well, it didn't even take it to me in, in uh, live share, so that's okay. Let's try that again. Maybe I just hit the wrong button. Or you're going to get like 50 million of these things shoved somewhere. Who knows? Actually, let me uh, follow participant, and then it'll always put me exactly where your cursor yeah. is. Weird. Okay. So it's not even going to let me do what I wanted to do. That's fine. So for whatever reason, it's not wanting me to, it's not allowing me to create a new file. So I'll just go over here and do it this way. So the way to do a new partial class or to extend is it's literally public partial class, and in your case, employee. Right, because that's the name entity, of the employee entity. Uh, is that the name? It has to be the same name as wherever the model is. Yeah, the model is employee entity. We're just translating it using a okay. auto mapper at the oh, end. Okay, so we'll do uh, employee entity. Um, that means we may have to shuffle this file around a little bit, but with this partial class, we can now say this also implements I key definer. Uh, I don't want to move the type. Oh, is it going to bark about employee entity? Oh, um, yeah, we may have to move that interface to a namespace that makes sense, but it doesn't really matter. But we can essentially do something like this. And then whatever this method says, we can say like, all right, cool, forget key. It always returns back name or, or wherever the field is. Yeah. Um, or um, because we, we don't like uh, stringly name things, you can actually use this really cool name of operator. And then whatever, um, oh, is it not gonna, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think, what's the name of the key for employee in this case? Is no, it because the namespace isn't li lining up, I uh, think. Okay, but you could actually do something like this. That would actually work the way you would expect. Oh yeah. Um, and if you, and if someone- We could actually to... do that real quick. We could just yeah, yeah, namespace, uh, com, red hat, if I can type. Back. We're only just uh, doing this live, man. Don't worry about it. Models. <laughs> now everything should line up. Oh yeah, all the a bunch of the squigglies went away. Yeah, and I imagine if I started mousing over a few things, it's like, hey, you're mixing. Oh, uh, do you have um, some type like ghost docs or something that's barking about miss, uh, missing comments? Probably. Okay. So, but this now works. So, if you were to re, um, if you were to re, uh, regenerate employee entity, this stuff still survives. Right. So this is that's cool. Approach. Yeah. The downside, though, you're going to be writing some code, right? Like, like the downside is you're going to be writing a little bit more code. Uh, that that doesn't bother me as long as it's readable understandable code that's that's the important bit uh i i have no problem with verbosity i think verbosity is very good in many cases sure i think verbosity makes it clear what your code is doing uh i think a lot of the whole you know the the hipster javascript let's make everything two lines long even though we can't tell what the heck's going on <laughs> is bs i think there's somewhere to be in the middle right like like anything else um, but no, I, I get what you're saying. I'd much rather be a little bit more verbose such that the next poor developer that picks up my code knows what, kind of what I was trying to do. Uh, Absolutely. Get, next guy principle applies. And always assume that the next guy is a serial murderer. Yeah. Or me three months from now when I'm sleep deprived because I have a two-year-old <laughs> at home and six, one half dozen another. Um, but yeah. So one thing to keep in mind, 
um, when you move this stuff to their own files, that file name can be called whatever you'd like because it's the fact that this line, this name matches up with the other partial class. That's how that magic works. Mm -hmm. And as long as the namespace at the top of that it's defined in matches, everything will match up. Got it. You get, yep, you got it. So you can't do that in Java. You can't do that in Java. Um, so even though I'm not a Java dev, when um, when I like onboard new uh, developers at my company, a lot of them have Java as their primary language from schooling or whatever. So I have to do a lot of translation of like, yeah, you do that in Java. And I think it's kind of close to something like this in .NET. Um, and then they tell me very quickly, oh, that's kind of cool. Or like, no, Cameron, you're fundamentally wrong. Could you please suck a little bit less? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah we can do a little better. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you something I found like somewhat shocking. Uh, we were doing some experiments a little while back with serverless, which is a fancy way of saying a container that scales to zero when you're not using it mm -hmm. inside of Kubernetes. And uh, so one of the big things you're concerned about when you're writing code that you're going to use a serverless is startup time. How quickly is it to the point where it can serve requests, right? Because you don't want the, the user to wait 30 seconds a minute for the runtime to spin up, the code to load up, everything to link up, and then it can start serving requests. Right. And we were doing various comparisons. And one of the complaints that a lot of people have made about Java over the years is it's got a very slow startup. Um, and that's not necessarily true anymore. Most of the time, Java applications start up in two or three seconds these days. But there's now GraalVM, which allows you to compile Java to a native binary. And so startup seconds times goes down to millis, which is really good. Uh, and we did a comparison of .NET Core 3 versus Quarkus, which is a, a Red Hat framework, an open source Red Hat framework that uses that native image compilation. Mm -hmm. And they were within nanoseconds of one another. And one is compiled to a native binary, and one is running on the CLR. Nice. OK, interesting. Interesting. So .NET Core startup inside of a Linux container is hella fast. Mm -hmm. Microsoft's worked really it, hard on that. Yeah, no, I, I'm really impressed. And, it, and the fact that the, the open source community around .NET has gotten so much better under Nadella, I, I'm proud to call Microsoft a Red Hat partner and, and be happy to work with them. I wouldn't have done that back in the Balmer days. Well, the yeah. interesting part is a lot of the seeds that you're seeing right now were actually planned during the Balmer days. It just wasn't at that level. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Now, with it be said, I, I remember really falling out of my seat when I heard, uh, you know, Scott Goo talking about how he was an open source part of MVC. Yeah. I mean, open source is, has rocked the world over the last decade. It's just unreal. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be open source or developers just kind of turn their noses up at it. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how many times where I've had to work with the library and it's like, oh crap, why isn't this working correctly? And I had to go look at the source code. Like uh, back before they open source some of the, you know, wind forms type stuff, there's not um, like I would run into bugs and I'd have to like stack overflow is my only hope. Right, and now I can actually go like, oh, that's weird. Let me go see what's supposed to be doing, and I look at the source code. I'm like, ah, oh, that's where I'm messing up. Right, like it, it, it's so it's super helpful for that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we had a bug just the other day, and I was trying to train one of my junior devs. He's like, okay, I've got this Helm chart, but I can't figure out what order these resources are applied to this Kubernetes cluster. And I'm like, have you gone and looked at the source code? And he's like, huh, yeah, this is open source. And he, he like messages me back 30 minutes later. He's like, I found it. There is this list that shows the order the resources are applied. And here's the code. And I was like, good job. Remember that lesson. <laughs> well, it's just something that's normally not taught a whole lot, right? Like, um, I don't know anything about the engineers you work with, right? But a lot of, but a lot of engineers I've worked with in the past come from a four-year degree, two-year degree type background. And the idea of like, yeah, no, you can just totally go find that online, please. Please go do that, right? It's not something that's taught, right? So there's a lot of eye-opening type stuff like that. Like, yeah, no, go look at the code. You, you can literally go find it. Use the source, Luke. Yeah, I, 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 oh, it's cool. So you get to use that, uh, you get double usage out of that, that quote. You, 
think you hit me up earlier with the link uh link to t uh link to db earlier which was fun uh yeah yeah when uh, when he was talking about not commerce earlier i was like which which orm i haven't heard of any other orms for net other than entity framework and then i was then i went and looked at the source code for not commerce found the the cs project file i was like oh it must be this link to db thing <laughs> Well, I mean, so for .NET, right, you've got Entity Framework. Uh, Dapper is another really common one for your micro ORMs. Uh, Petapoco, uh, massive. Uh, Link to SQL used to be a thing, but I'm not sure if that's still really supported. Uh, I'm sure it's still supported, at least on the .NET Framework. Right, but like, I don't know if it's like, if you're doing something from scratch, here, go start with this. Like, no. I don't think it's got uh -huh. that support anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it's been an interesting ride the last couple of months uh, trying to learn this language in my free time and get up to the point where I can actually support customers with it. It's, um, but I have no complaints about the language so far. Uh, it, it's a it's a very nice language. Uh, I I'm a little I'm stumbling a little bit with the build tools like CS project files and solution files and, but they're really not any worse than what I deal with in Java. It's just different and getting used to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I have a sneaking yeah. suspicion you're probably used to Palm and Maven. Yeah. Or or Node.js package JSON files, or Python setup.py files, or Ruby gem bundles, or I, I swear I've programmed in pretty much every programming language you can imagine that's been used in commercial development. I'm really glad you put that last qualifier. That because I was about to ask some really interesting questions like only commercial use guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't do Haskell. I've done only a very little bit of stuff with Lisps. Uh, I've done a little bit of stuff with scheme based languages like Erlang. Um, I actually really like Erlang. That's a very nice language, uh, but it warps your brain in strange ways, and you it takes a while to adjust to doing it. <laughs> I don't disagree. Um, when I started learning functional, though, that's what made my brain break in a lot of ways. And so when I look at stuff like Elixir, which is essentially Erlang with a little bit nicer syntax for the most for the most part, there, there's some semantic differences. Ruby-esque syntax, yeah. Yes, right. But it's like a lot of the same concepts, like, cool, how do you recurse? How do you deal with things that fail, right? And uh, in that community, it's like, yeah, let it fail, please. Right, put the supervisor trees in, put in your, you know, that type of stuff. And it's like, wow, that just works <laughs> out of the box. Yep. yep. You know, like Supervisors are a really big superpower. Oh, yeah. it, it was funny. I learned Erlang. I was working at a company that built DNS servers. And so we needed very low latency, high throughput. And Erlang was the perfect fit. Uh, especially for parsing network protocols. Erlang just has really nice capabilities around that. Uh, and then my next job, I was doing Java again. And I was like, man, I'd really like to have some of those concepts of Erlang in the JVM. And it, that's where I discovered there's this uh, toolkit called Vertex, which is basically heavily inspired by Erlang's message passing system and uh, fast failure kind of concepts. You can do recursion in it. It's, it's pretty nice. And that's, that's what got me hired at Red Hat is I was heavily involved in that community for several years. Nice. Yeah. Because Red Hat is like, they, they productized Vertex. It's one of our supported developer platforms. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. No, this is pretty nice. Now, let me ask one more question just us on a different topic. Should I be using async await on these controllers or does it really matter? Is it gonna make that big of a performance difference? Uh, it depends. <laughs> okay. I, I yeah. mean, I mean so sometimes it you gotta be careful the other way around. Yeah, sure. So like, so let me ask you this, right? So I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna put my engineering hat for a minute. What's the goal of this product that you're working on? Like all this code, is this for examples? Is this for teaching? Is this like legit? Like, so the actual application, the, the first implementation was done in Spring Boot. That is actually gonna go to production in 
uh, another week or two as, as long as we finish our security audits internally. So this is a this is a web application so that consultants within Red Hat Consulting can rate each other's skill sets at the end of a, a consulting engagement. Oh, so gotcha. we can give each other feedback, right? Uh, yeah, makes sense. Uh, feedback but, 360 and all that's in here. Yep, totally makes sense now. Yep, yep. And, and the thing is though, as a learning experience and as a way of building out reference architectures and as a way of helping us validate our methodologies on a number of different languages, frameworks, methodologies, we're doing this exact same application and implementing it in every runtime we support. So that's Spring Boot, Quarkus, Java EE, Vertex, Node.js, and um, 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 well, .NET, obviously. Dot .NET, yeah. No. Yeah. And so basically, this is a real-world production application. We could easily swap the Spring Boot version with the .NET version. Uh, I was actually able to, this whole code base I did in the span of about nine hours this past weekend. Nice. Because most of this is generated code coming from the API contract. And so as long as I have the API contract and I'm, I'm taking good care to write a clear, concise, thorough API contract, I can generate most of the code. Mm -hmm. um, which is, that's the, the talk I was proposing to Chad via email earlier this evening. I was like, hey, I'd love to come and present this to the .NET group and see what they think and get their feedback as well. Don't see why not. I mean, to me, it's good stuff. And and it's also, it's always nice to see how other people approach problems, right? Like, I'm going to be honest with you. I've not worked a whole lot with Open API, So I'm learning all sorts of cool stuff right now. Like, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. I've never really touched that before. Well, traditionally, a lot of people have used like Swagger and Open API to generate like that Swagger UI that's yes. like documenting your API. So that's code first generating the Swagger information. Right. Uh, and in recent years, people have been starting to turn that around, start with the contract definition and generate most of the code. And the, the positive side to this is I can take this same API spec and I can generate a client library for JavaScript that I can use in my React app or my Angular app or my Vue.js app. Or I can generate a client library in Java that can now talk to my .NET API. Uh, and the client libraries, honestly, you don't have to touch the code. You just generate it, publish it to your artifact repository, and you're done. Uh, and it's all type safe, and you don't have to worry about the semantics of REST and HTTP and, and did I call the right method and did I get the right result uh, status code. No, the, the client SDK does all of that validation for you. You just get either here's the object you asked for or the list of objects you asked for, or here's the error. Gotcha. Yeah, so I do have experience on sharing the Swagger docs, but I've never like worked it the other way. It's like, okay, cool, given this, go create like uh, consumers of it. However, um, mm -hmm. showing my age slightly, it reminds me a crap ton of WSDL definitions and the good old... Good uh, <laughs> Exactly. No, no, no. So everything <laughs> old like... is new again. No, so absolutely. let's go even older. C++ header files. Well, that's still around though. Right. But it's the same idea, except we're applying it in this new web API world. Just new content. Um, and, you know, people eschew these things for a while and then it just comes back around and it, they eschew it for a while and it comes back around and it's, it's a loop. <laughs> It's, it's like every time, uh, what was it, about 15, 20 years ago when virtualization started to become popular. And I was like, this isn't new, people. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you, if you go back and look at uh, what was the, the, the one that they used to run on mainframes, uh, VM. Oh, crap. I can't remember. Anyway, there was a virtualized mainframe operating system that gave you, you know, your own virtual machine. And it was time sliced, just like virtual machines were. And that was back in the 70s. Gotcha. So 
And containers are just virtualization done over a little bit lighter weight with a thinner shim in between you and the hardware. So it, it's all cycles. It's the same thing over and over again. Maybe we learned some lessons the last time. Maybe we didn't. <laughs> so it, it's kind of uh, interesting you mentioned that, right? Like what, what's old is new again. It kind of makes you wonder if it's because like the number of people in the industry is doubling at such a rate. Yeah. Like you're dumping so many new people into it that it literally is like, wow, this is a really cool concept. And then people have been around for a little minute goes, nah, this has been here for a moment. Like it just may have been slightly before your time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's and 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 people complaining about YAML are remind me of the whole XML holy wars and <laughs> Yeah, but YAML, YAML sucks. I anything it's okay. Makes, it gets on my nerves a little put, bit. Anything that makes me put spaces in just to make sure that it's in the right place. No, that's that's just wrong. Yeah. I actually do prefer JSON because it's a little more structured yeah, uh, right. because I often screw up my indentation in my YAML files, often. Uh, but the nice thing is, is technically YAML is a superset of JSON. So anytime you want, you can replace anything in a YAML file with JSON. Hmm. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yep. Uh, one nice thing, though, is in a YAML file, you can actually add comments, and your parser won't argue with you about putting comments in your JSON. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't chuck a brick, right? Yeah. Because the JSON spec doesn't allow comments, and so if your parser is following the spec to the letter, it won't allow comments. So that's always interesting. Uh, pardon me, I've got somebody knocking on my office door. Okay. Well, then what are you still doing? I yeah, know, right? But hey, I was pretty cool that we came up with a, a nice little solution for uh, Devin's problem. That <laughs> little, little partial class trick there. Now, he may call. He may reach out to me in a couple weeks, like Cameron. This was such a bad idea, and I'm like, I told you, I told you at the beginning, this was a terrible idea, but it didn't solve your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is this is my my junior apprentice developer Colin, uh, and uh, he wanted to remind me that I'm supposed to go brush my teeth with him. Yeah, we do that like every night. So that's Chad. Say hi, Chad. Hi, Chad. Hey, Cameron. And then the other gentleman is Cameron. You can say hi to Cameron too, and he'll his hi, face Cameron. will pop up if he talks. Hey, Colin. How's it going, man? <laughs> they all have green screen background. Oh, actually, his is a plug-in on his laptop, oh. so he doesn't actually have a real green screen yeah. like Daddy does. He's just got cool Ooh. software that that fakes it. Are you using Connect or are you using uh, Snapcam? Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for your back. Oh, that's for your virtual background. That's literally Zoom. I just yeah. uploaded an image and Zoom's doing that. I'm not doing anything custom, nothing crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're making so this, like, I have, like, this I, huge setup and I'm like, no, 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 no. No, I've got a couple hundred dollars worth of, of lighting and, and green screen and <laughs> because I record a lot of videos for Red Hat. You have a couple hundred years of training for HTML. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Go brush your <laughs> Oh. Uh, the joys of being a parent when they, oh, you've been doing this for 200 years, right? I'm like, I am not that old. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, no. Probably no one in, on the earth. Is All right. No more comments from the peanut gallery. <laughs> Well, thank you for the suggestions, Cameron. I, I will definitely take a look at this method uh, for the IKEA definer and and trying to generify that query filter predicate. Um, so fingers crossed. Fingers so crossed. Here's your here's your trick on when you set up that funk or whatever logic. The Googleable phrase you're looking for is type constraint, a generic type constraint. That is your million dollar phrase you're going .net. to. Generic type constraint. All right, typing it into Google right now so I can read about it here in a little while. Okay, I've dominated everybody's time enough. <laughs> Anybody else who wants to chat can chat. Actually, everyone else is gone, but. 
Oh, it's just the three of us then. Okay. Well, no, cool. well, so Beth is actually still here. Actually, we've got 16 people sitting on, on Twitch right now watching us. Oh, really? Yeah. They, they just fell asleep and stuck around and forgot well, to turn on. that might be the case, but <laughs> <laughs> actually, no one, because it's been bouncing around. I mean, we, we've hit 17, 18 people. Uh, uh, nice. People are coming in, coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, nothing else. It's uh, time to put a pin in this one, then. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Uh, well, Kevin, really do appreciate it. Devin, I appreciate it too, because I mean, you, you know, you added more to the to the evening. Well, I appreciate you guys being here to help me answer some of these questions. So we have, you know, maybe four .NET developers at Red Hat. <laughs> And uh, I, I asked all of them a lot of these questions, and I quickly exhausted their expertise. They're like, what do you mean a repository? And I'm like, oh, my God, you people don't use repositories in .NET? That scares me. And then I, I did more searching. And, of course, yes, repositories are a thing in .NET. Lots of people do it. It's just they didn't know about it. And then I started asking about, you know, generifying those, those filter predicates. And they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, God. Urgh. And then I reached out to Wes, uh, Wes Rice, mm -hmm. and Wes is super, super busy. He just started a new job with VMware, uh, and oh, yeah, yeah, I just found out this week myself, and he's like, oh, yeah, you want this Steel Toe library, and that's basically Netflix OSS for .NET, and I was like, no, 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 that's not what I was asking at all. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I, I'm really glad that this lined up with, I have all these .NET questions. I need people I can ask. Oh, that's cool. 